special pleasure for me to introduce Lars Iyer today for this workshop. And I'm very pleased to see how many people have joined us. Um, the faces that I've been seeing through the session. Um, um, I'm, I'm staring at Jonathan, is, Bennett is sitting there right in front of me on the screen as it happens on the top. But, um, uh, 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 familiar faces, but also others that have joined us. I think this is terrific. And um, especially, I, I'm, I'm just very delighted that Lara Zaya has, has uh, agreed to do this with us. Uh, Lars is someone, Nemanja and I have um, been very aware of his work uh, for quite a number of years. Um, and it's uh, um, originally his work on Blanchot. A couple of books, I'll, I'll just give you a quick title, title versions, uh, Blanchot's Communism and Blanchot's Vigilance. These are really significant contributions um, to, to Blanchot. Um, thinking, research, scholarship, um, that really uh, terrific books. And uh, there, there's, there's quite a body of writing, which I, I urge you once again to look at our uh, faculty page on the website. You'll see um, his bio and, uh, and, and, his, um, and his publications there. Um, but he, his work in the last, uh, well, in the last years has taken a very interesting uh, literary turn. And that's also his professional position. He was work started as a philosopher, if I understand correctly, and then moved into creative writing uh, at Newcastle University. Um, and he has been doing a kind of writing that I think is, is uh, well, especially pertinent to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to what goes on at the European Graduate School in that he works with philosophical uh, concepts and figures as in, in, a, in, a, in a form of writing and novelistic writing that is, uh, that's very playful, um, but also very searching, very, very interesting. And um, so it's, um, he's, he's, he has been immensely successful in both areas in theory and, and, and writing. And it's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting case uh, for us. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm delighted we're able to bring together people who are working in crossroads, you know, cross-disciplinary crossroads. And um, Lars is one of these working between um, uh, writing, creative writing and, and uh, philosophical writing. So I, I don't want to burden him with more <laughs> introduction. Um, I just wanted to say how, how happy I am that he's joining us. And, um, and I look forward very much to listening to his voice today and, um, and, and hearing hearing his his, uh, his presentation. Um, so, without more, I will pass the screen to Lars. And again, uh, with a warm thank you and welcome. Thank you very much for that uh, that introduction. It's a great honour to be here at the European Graduate School. So it's a wonderful thing. Um, so let me uh, let me begin. Welcome to you all. Um, Please refer to me by my first name, my first name, Lars. I've been, I'm a novelist nowadays. I've been publishing fiction for about 10 years and teaching creative writing for about five years. And prior to that, I've been teaching, I taught philosophy for many years. You know, the reason I got into creative writing was because I realized I was never be able to, I'd never be able to think like the thinkers I admire. I'd never be able to live like them. I'd never, I never really measured up to the thinkers I admire so much. And what, what may be able, I think, to, to, to break through into creative writing is that I, could, I, I embrace this failure. I embrace this failure to succeed philosophically, to, to work philosophically as I as I'd, I'd intended to do. You know, I, I really wanted to try and be someone who could, who could think. I, I, I struggled to do this. And was, I think creative writing opened to me when I embraced this failure, when I began to work with this failure, to write about this failure, to write about what I wanted to be and, and wasn't. So perhaps this, this, this failure, which I felt about my philosophical work, was something which blossomed into something, I suppose it sounds, it sounds like hybridic to say this, something successful in creative writing. And this working with failure is what today's workshop is all about. I'm speaking to you from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne in the north of England, not far from um, Scotland. My connection is very good. I've had no problems with it over the last six months. If my connection does break, I can dash into my office, which is only 20 minutes away. So bear with me if anything happens. As I say, you know, my connection is, is excellent. Um, so there shouldn't be an issue. 
The workshop today is entitled um, Without Authority, The Solitude of Writing. And this is a creative writing workshop. You don't need to have, have had any prior experience of creative writing in an academic setting to participate. You don't have to study, um, you don't have to have studied creative writing at all. An interest in it is sufficient. And this workshop, I hope, will be of use to you if you think of yourself as a poet or as a playwright, as a screenwriter, as a fiction writer, as a creative non-fiction writer, whatever it is you want to do in creative writing, I really hope this is something that will be of use to you. And as the workshop, workshop progresses, I will draw increasingly on philosophical and theoretical ideas. And again, you don't need any background in these areas, um, not at all. I hope that you know, we will progress in a way that, that, um, that makes these ideas spring up from our discussion. And I hope we will be discussing some ideas and discussing some of your writing as we proceed. Um, the, the, this, this, this philosophical and, and theoretical interest which I have um, is something which I hope to, to work with you through, through literary examples. Um, we're not gonna launch into any difficult or abstruse text straight away. We're gonna begin, I hope, very, very simply, very, very easily. As I've said, with any, like any workshop, um, I hope you'll be writing as well. So I hope that you'll be ready at, at a moment's notice to engage in some exercises. Some of these exercises will be very straightforward, very short. Some of them will be more searching. So we'll build up to the longer exercises as we proceed today over these two two-hour sessions. And I hope you'll leave the workshop today at the end of these four hours with something you can go on to develop, something you can do something with. So I hope you can take away something that will be of use to you um, as writers, whatever kind of writers that you might be. So let's, uh, let, let's make a start. First section of my, of my talk today, um, the talking section of the workshop is called Why I Hate Creative Writing. So why I hate creative writing. And this is not a view which I actually have. It's a view which uh, the, the contemporary English novelist, playwright and critic, uh, Gabriel Josvavici, so Gabriel Josvavici has, has, has made. So Gabriel Josvavici is a writer whose work I greatly admire. It spans several genres. You know, he, he's, a, he's a major literary writer, one of the finest literary writers working in, in the UK today in the field of you know, novel writing, short stories, He's written plays, radio dramas, all kinds of things. He's also a major critic, and he's written so many of these wonderfully lucid, um, critical works on all kinds of different subjects. My favorite critical work he's done is on the Bible. Fantastic work on the Bible. But he's written also about literature which we think of as, as modernist. He's written about medieval literature. He's written about Shakespeare. He's written about... Greek tragedy, pretty much everything in his work. Josvavici was born in 1940. He's born in Nice. Um, he survived the war in the French Alps. He was actually brought up in Cairo. You know, that's where that's where his mother's family were from and his father's family. They were Egyptian Jewish, and he eventually accompanied his mother to England in 1956. But went on to read uh, English at Oxford and became a professor at uh, Sussex University. He retired in 1998, and he's still very much an active part of, uh, of UK intellectual life. He's someone who I always feel is, is, is a bit marginalised, a bit neglected. It's a bit frustrating for me, actually, to see that. But nevertheless, for those of us who admire his work, he's a major presence. And because of this, because of this admiration, I've always been very struck by um, Josip Avicii's um, distrust of creative writing. You know, um, if it were anyone else saying this, this might not be an issue for me. You know, if, if it was just someone on the street saying this, that's absolutely fine. But when Josper Vici makes these claims, then I take them pretty seriously. So, you know, I want to begin today's workshop by just taking up the challenge Josper Vici makes to those of us who teach in creative writing, who are interested in creative writing as an academic discipline. And what I'm, I'm going to do is take a remark that he just tossed out in an interview. So this is not something which he's written about in a sustained way in his work. It's really a remark which he makes in an interview. Um, and in this interview, it's a very long interview, the Numero 5 uh, website, 15,000 words or so. 
he summarizes his own background as a as a writer. He writes a, an autobiography as a writer, which of course for him is also an autobiography as a reader. And we'll come back to this um, autobiography, this, this autobiographical dimension um, to his critical work and also to his creative work, where he often talks about what he's, what he's read, listened to. Uh, he talks about you know, things he's seen as well, paintings are very important to him. Anyway, in this interview, towards the end of this interview, he makes this remark. And let me put this up on PowerPoint for you. It's actually a pretty simplistic remark here. Um, nothing complicated here at all. What he says is, that is why I so hate creative writing courses. They teach you to avoid brick walls, but I think hitting them allows you to discover what you and only you want to, can, or must say. Not always, of course. The artistic life is full of frustrations and failures, as well as breakthroughs. You are alone. No one can help you. Let me read this again, just to let this sink in. That is why I, I so hate creative writing courses. So Yosef Babici here is very, very passionate. They teach you how to avoid brick walls, but I think hitting them allows you to discover what you and only you want to, can, or must say. Not always, of course. The artistic life is full of frustrations and failures. See that, that theme of failure, I talked about that earlier. The artistic life is full of frustrations and failures as well as breakthroughs. You are alone. No one can help you. I want to begin by inviting you to engage in a writing exercise. Please imagine here that you support this argument. Work intuitively, work quickly. Please write right now. Why do a creative writing course might prevent you from discovering what you and only you can, want to, must say.
another minute or so. Okay. Now, using the, the magic of Zoom, I wonder if you could indicate whether you, if you prepare to, to, to discuss your answer to the question with me using, I'm not sure, whatever, whatever form is available to you. Anyone there prepared to, to discuss your answer to the question? Raise a hand or use whatever other signals available to you. Hello, if I Adira? Yes. yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you, um, what's your experience of creative writing? Um, very little. I am actually more of a critical writer. I write about art and things. I'm not really mm -hmm. a creative writer, but I'm interested in exploring it and I'm sort of working my way through it. So I'm a complete novice at this. I've never attended a creative writing course. So it's quite new. <laughs> Okay, so you're someone who's, um, you're, you're a critical writer, you write about art and other things as well. Um, tell me how you think creative writing might be able to help you develop your, your skills, your abilities as a writer. Well, essentially, I was sort of thinking about it um, more as a, a way to build narratives, a way to tell stories. Um, so something that I have been very used to in my field is, is that you structure your work in a certain way so that it makes sense, you know, you, so it's very analytical and it has to make certain points. But I, I, the more compelling stories or the more compelling writing of any sort are the ones where you can tell a story. And I think if you can tell a story, regardless of what the subject matter is, whether it's science or art or anything, it does get across to readers or at least to me far more effectively than a very critical piece of writing in which it, it may be making the same exact point, but it's a difference of how, it, at what level it gets to you. Sometimes things get to you deeper if it is more of a story. Um, this is just sort of my very, <laughs> um, sure. my own yeah, sort of way of thinking about it. Thank you. This, this idea of something getting to you, something reaching you. The piece of writing might, might reach you in some sense. What you're saying here, as I understand it, is that you're, you're someone who writes critically, but for you, getting these abilities to, to, um, to tell stories, to structure your work in a, in a different way, might enable you to reach an audience more easily. And that's something you think that creative writing could help you with. So it's really increasing your power to tell a story to build a narrative with the expression you use. Thank you, Adira. Anyone else care to share your, your thoughts with me? Yeah, hello. Hello, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll catch up with you a moment. Um, where are you on my screen here? Is this Christian? Chris yeah, hello. Wonderful, yes, please, Christian. Uh, tell me, your, your, have you done academic writing? Have you done creative writing in academic setting before? Uh, yeah, in a way, yes, I've done it, uh, slightly, I would say. Um, yeah, but nothing like, uh, I think my biggest problem is like I, I, I do a little poetry, a little story here, a little short yeah. story, and um, yeah. Um, so you're I mean, someone who, you, you've been writing um, in poetry and, and a story, but as I understand it, not in a sustained way. And what do you have ambitions as a creative writer? And what would they be? What do you, what would you want to do? Well, to be honest, now I'm trying to finish my dissertation here at the ES. And uh, and and look, when you ask this question, it's what I want actually. It's like 
I want to get like almost like a this like a genie to come into me, you know, that I will yeah. flow into creative writing and into finishing my dissertation and and uh, get into this like almost magical flow of writing. That's wonderful. I love the idea of a flow. This is, this is something I associate with rap music. And Cool Keith, the idea of someone who can flow, where, 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 this, where rap just seems to be born of itself. You see these people freestyling. It's an, it's an incredible, um, incredible gift. Now, do you see this creative writing as something in tension, um, is it in, in, in some kind of tension with your dissertation? Or, or, or are, they, are they part of the same thing? I feel it's part of the same thing. It's like I'm in this course, like to get some like more knowledge or there is this genie to, to yeah. be able to flow. But uh, as if some, you know, when I was writing, as if something is missing. And but then I said, it's like sure, I'm still getting like this ultimate thing that I need, you know. And so I'm, co yeah, yes, yeah, something missing, something you're looking for. This is very interesting. Um, something, something missing, something you're looking for. Uh, okay, that that you want to discover. Perhaps creative writing as a as a course could help you discover this to open this out. We talked about the idea of a genie, some someone, something which could which could touch you in such a way that the writing would flow. The writing would have a natural flow. That writing would issue forth from you. And you know, you you, you, you currently write a little little bit a little poetry poetry. Uh, some, some short stories, but there'd be, a, there'd be something which could be unleashed, which would respond to this, this desire to answer to, to what is missing. Um, you know, because I, it becomes, it, it also feels, uh, to be honest, you know, it feels like so, like, unnatural. So it feels natural. You know, it's like a little yeah. bit of an effort. Ah, you know? so, okay. So then I say, maybe this is not for me, you know, I'm made for something else, but... Sure. But you feel a sense of vocation about creative writing. You feel called to do it in some sense. Okay. No, I, I would like, in a way, yes, and in a way, not. Mm. Right, so it's a question for you then of whether you feel you can unlock this flow. And if you can't, that would be something which would prevent you from embracing creative yeah. writing. Your, your, your strengths might lie elsewhere. Exactly. That, that is, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so this then is a test for you. Um, you're going to find out what kind of writer you are, whether you're someone whose vocation calling to try and write something will translate into something which, which you regard as, as being worthwhile. Thank you, Christian. Um, anyone else care to, to uh, step up? Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, Mikhail. Is that Mikhail? No? Hello. no who, who am I talking to here? Let me this just, is Shantanu uh, here. Oh, yes, Santanu. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, but tell uh, me now, tell me, tell me, of your, tell me your, your uh, experience of creative writing. Are you someone who writes privately, you know, on your own, outside of institution? Have you had experience of writing within, within a university before? Uh, I have completed my master's in Bengali literature. It's uh, my own literature in regional language. And I try to write different things. I mainly try to write a drama and poetry sometimes. Mm. But I think that uh, everybody has their own world and they have their own unique life. And not everyone can express their own feelings. So I think like somebody can help them to uh, express their ideas, not what to write, but how to write. This is what I feel for the creative writing. And I have some voice idea about like I have a feeling, like I have to write about this, like I'm feeling something, but idea is very voice, not I cannot express it in the, I mean, I cannot write everything in the page and the note paper. So I want to express it in the, how I can express it in my writing, how I can tell it, all my inner feelings in the word, in the pages. So that is what I think that one mentor can help me. So if you can tell me a few words about this, thank you. Sure. Thank you, thank you very much, Santan, um, um, Santanu. What interests me here is this idea of the what and the how. The you, it's not a question of what you want to write. This is something which you feel yes. each of us has a unique life, you know, so each of us has a, a singular yeah. take on the world and a way of experiencing things which is uniquely ours. Yeah. 
view it's a question yeah. in your case yeah. of, of unlocking this in some sense um, it's not a question of what you yeah, want to yeah. write but how you write so you, you, you talked about feeling something and this feeling something you identify as being yeah. inner and you want this you want to express this yeah. but the question of the question of expressing this at the moment is not obvious to you you've written drama you've written poetry uh, but you know somehow this is this, you know this is this is not yet where you want to be you don't you don't feel in possession of your powers in some sense as a creative writer so this is what you're looking to to express it have, have i understood have i understood you correctly yes yes you're perfect and one other thing i just would like to mention here like there when i read the greek poetry there is a, another dimension of their writing when i read something postmodern writing of like samuel beckett i'm reading some another type of writing there so everything they have their own form they have their own dimension when they're writing so uh, i'm feeling like when i'm reading like greek poetry i'm feeling like i can write like this like this uh, Three structure and notion and everything. When I'm writing Beckett, uh, reading Beckett, I'm thinking like I can deformalize and can destructure this uh, notion. So sure. it's like when I'm just reading like this and I'm feeling like this way. So I cannot just find my own voice and I cannot just express my own feeling. That how I can express my own feeling in the words. So I want to express this. If you can help me. Thank you. Okay. So so what's interesting here for me is that you you, you talk about reading different kinds of creative writing, Greek poetry. Mm -hmm. um, writers like Beckett. And what you're saying here is, you know, yep. when, if I understand you rightly, when you're reading these, these writers, you feel that their voice is something which, which um, is, is compelling and it, it, it sort of overtakes your own, your own voice in some way. This is, this is a, a topic very close to my heart. So this is something I hope we can, I'll remember mm -hmm. this, we'll, we'll yeah. come back to this in yeah. today's workshop. So there's, there's something here which um, you want to express and what, what one of the difficulties I understand it is you feel there's too many different ways in which you could express yourself. There's this way, there's that way. Each of them has their um, attractions, mm -hmm. Greek poetry or Beckett. And, yes. and you know, the question is, which would have necessity for you? Which would take the form of a kind of destiny? Mm -hmm. Which way of writing would feel this is the way you have to write? And this is, again, this is a topic very close to my heart. Um, we'll come back to this today, but this is very much the predicament of the modern writer where we don't have an authority, we don't have a, someone who's going to tell us exactly how we're going to write. We, we are alone, we, you know, we have a state of solitude with respect to the blank page. So we, hopefully I'll be, I'll be um, addressing the issues that you identified here. Well, thank you for your questions, your, your, your answers so far. I want to move um, to, to another uh, question, which is very strongly related to the first. And again, the idea here is for me to understand your background, where it is you're coming from, what you're looking for, um, your ideas, your way of formulating things. So let me just uh, bring up on the screen a second question. Mm. Mm. So what I'm looking for now is the very opposite. I've asked you whether you, you know, if, if, um, what creative writing might, might give you, um, how it might help you. But what I want now is for you to raise some questions about you know, how it might not help you. How doing creative writing might prevent you from discovering what you and only you can or must say. So here it's exactly the same quotation we're working with, but I want to ask you how you how creative writing might prevent you? you know, what are your anxieties about doing creative writing? Uh, how do you think it might prevent you from discovering what you and only you can uh, want to and must say? And again, eight minutes for this, please.
I know our students are a little bit confused because you reverted to the previous slide. So can you uh, go oh. to the, the other right slide? It's another minute or so. So let's round things up there if we can. We'll see each other. Anyone care to share their thoughts on the problem, problems that might face you in a creative writing course or creative writing in general? It'd be wonderful to hear from someone who studied creative writing at university in an, in an academic setting. Any, any, anyone who's come from that background at all? Hi. <laughs> Hi, who, who's speaking? Oh, so is that Annalise? Yes, hello. Hi, yeah. Annalise, tell us about your background in creative writing. Um, I just wrote some of my thoughts into the chat, but I, um, I just finished grad school for poetry um, mm. in May. So I've spent three years in creative writing workshops, um, mostly for poetry and a little bit for fiction. And yeah, I, don't, I can read what I wrote 
in the chat. Sure, please, loud, please do. Yeah, go, go right ahead. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so I said, I think it's a lot more nuanced than this, and it depends on the artist, the stage, and their development at which they choose to study creative writing and the quality of the class. It can be helpful or harmful. Um, I've just spent three years in writing workshops, and it's absurd to say that they teach you to avoid brick walls, at least for poets. We don't learn how to write poetry in a workshop. We learn how to read poetry and how to understand and be articulate about our own work and others. Obviously, a workshop that tells you what or how to write is potentially going to get in the way, but a good workshop will never do that. And then I said, uh, frankly, an artist who takes an art class and then starts making only safe work or work to please the teacher or work that avoids the real questions they need to ask was probably not going to make interesting work in the first place. Well, thanks for this. This is really very interesting. And one thing to identify here is there's an issue about the stage of development. And for you, what stage of development do you think um, benefits least from creative writing courses? I mean, where, where might things, you know, at what stage shouldn't you do creative writing courses? Put it that way. I think you can do them at any stage if they're tailored to the stage. Um, mm. But personally, I've been writing poetry since I was a child and um, I was very intentional about never studying it until graduate school. And I think mm. for me, that was the right choice. Um, it's something you felt before graduate school, you didn't want to study this. And for what mm -hmm. reasons? What, what, why was that? I felt like I wanted to reach a point where I wouldn't be too swayed by other people's feedback. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So it's a question of having attained some sort of independence uh, having attained a level of, um, what, what would the expression be here? It's when you've, um, when, when you're able to really, uh, you have a, a trust in what you're doing. Would that be a way, you know, a trust in your own way of working? Would that be right? Or a confidence or belief, a self-belief? Would that, yeah, would that be the right way, way of putting it? it? Mm -hmm. So some kind of self-belief, some kind of trust in what you're doing. And that's interesting you should say that because it goes back to the point that Santana made earlier. Um, you know, there, there can be an issue where you're, you're pulled in all these different directions. And maybe you have to reach a stage first where you feel comfortable about what it is that you're doing, about your contribution, about um, that you'd have trust for your own work, your self-belief. And then, then you can benefit from this. Thank you very much um, for, your, for your thoughts. And one more person, again, it, it'd be wonderful to hear from someone who's, who's gone through um, creative writing in an academic setting. Yeah. Hi, Hello. Abia. Hi. Yeah. Tell um, me about your experience, I, Abia. I did a little bit of academic um, creative writing in academic setting. And, but it was, I think, a little helpful because the teachers were poets and, mm. and they tried to train me not to um avoid breaking walls they told me break walls if you can and they introduced me to these essays of blanche which is like the novel is a work of bad faith mm. so that got me thinking into uh, the sort of writing i did with some of the more traditional writers they seemed like they were intoxicated by literature and they were just uh, churning out those intoxicated feelings and, and um, mm. ideas. But I felt that once those intoxication wore off, uh, um, I sort of felt that what does this all have to do with me? And so I could not connect to what I was writing. Uh, so then I, read more Blanchot and I felt that this has to do with that modern subjectivity is determined by a Cartesian frame of reference. So that sort of already dictates what many creative writing courses teach. Uh, they reproduce that, uh, that fixation of thoughts and fail to become more fluid from where you can sort of get out of your who am I and the, the indifference of the I and its writing and the oh, I can you. connect to the writing. Yeah. This, this is extremely interesting. So for you, 
I love this, this phrase, intoxicated by literature. This is what you're finding in what you're calling more standard literature, more, more familiar literary works. And what you find from like Blanchot is a rejection of a frame of reference, a, a way of seeing um, uh, literature. Uh, this, this very much ties into what we've been talking about today. Um, so moving away from what you claim here is a, is a Cartesian frame of reference, the reference which we'd link to the philosopher Descartes. And in Descartes' work, yeah. we'd find something which is too fixed in some way. Uh, what you're looking for is a breaking with that fixity, um, because that, that fixity is something which we find across modern subjectivity, and we also find it in the creative writing course. This is, this is extremely yeah. interesting. So I'll be coming back to you later and asking what you think of, of the way we're doing things today and whether, whether this, this, you know, our, our way of proceeding will be helpful. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to return right. to, my, um, to my notes here and we'll move on a little bit further, if, 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 if I may. Okay, so, um, yes, here we are. So thank you for your, 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 your thoughts on, on Jos Babici there. Um, I want now to, to put a bit more flesh on Jos Babici's argument, on the bones of the argument, and try and identify exactly what the issue might be. He's identifying with creative writing um, courses. So yeah, okay. Um, there's a work he wrote in 1999. It's behind me here on trust. It's a very nice book, it's actually a very lucid and, and, and clear book um, on trust by Yodhra Vici in 1999. And in this book, he discusses craft. Um, craft is something he, which he calls into question as a model of the kind of writing that he that um, that, that, you know, that he thinks is significant. So craft for Yosbovici is something which does not form a, a useful model for the kind of writing that he privileges. It doesn't form a useful model for, 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 um, for, for modern writing. This is the word he uses here, modern writing. Let's not try and understand this term modernity too quickly in Yosbovici's work. Um, let's, you know, before we talk about modernity, let, let's talk a bit more about craft. Now, creative writing courses, you may, have, you may know this or you may not, often present themselves as teaching craft. I take Annalise's point that for Annalise, you know, the poetry workshop does not teach uh, poetry writing. It teaches, teaches us to read poetry. This is something to, to bear in mind. This is a very interesting perspective here. Um, Yosemite discusses craft in general as what you learn on a creative writing course. Now, what is craft? Well, the way he presents it, well, he understands craft, and we don't have to be limited by this, but this is how he understands it. Craft is a tradition of practice into which you're, you are inducted by a master. So in a craft, you're inducted into a particular kind of practice. It could be something like carpet weaving, you know, that you're learning how to become a carpet weaver. Now, in a craft, there's a sense that you're agreed upon common standards. So the idea of a craft then is something where you're agreed upon common standards, in what is accepted as a good example of practice. So you can see where Yosgovici is going here. He's telling us that in craft, there are common standards, there are examples of practice, which might be good or might be bad and so on. There are standards of, of attainment, which means your work can be judged, it can be marked, it can be ranked. It means your work can be put into competition with, with, other, with other craft workers in some sense. Now we may disagree with this as a model, but let, let's, let's, let's follow Yosbovici for the moment and see where he takes us. What Yosbovici argues is, is that not so long ago, writing was a genuine craft tradition. You know, writing was a kind of making, uh, much like you know, making um, uh, you know, carpet, something like this, you know. And what, according to Yosbovici, what happened was modernism. And Yosbovici's written a book on this topic. It's in my props here. Whatever happened to modernism from 2010? The most wide, uh, the, the best known of his um, critical books. Uh, he, he, you know, he was actually quite widely covered in the media because he he um, raised some questions about contemporary writers. Uh, he wanted to suggest that some contemporary UK writers were um, wrote in bad faith. They wrote in a meretricious way, um, and you know, there's, there's there's media coverage of a predictably facile kind. But anyway, um, for, for, for Yosbovici, if you understand modernism very broadly, typically if we read histories of modernism, we might think of early 20th century literature, 
or you might think of the period in philosophy, which is, which is, which is uh, begins with Descartes, the, the, the period of, of uh, modern subjectivity. Um, that's the, the idea that came up earlier. One of the ways of understanding modernity for Giotto Vici is to think in terms of this French Revolution and its aftermath, 1789, which sets in chain a whole series of events which are strongly linked to the emergence and the development of Romanticism. So Romanticism as a literary movement uh, for Giotto Vici, you know, comes out of the French Revolution, 1789, this, this particular year. We might also think of um, modern literature in this sense as being you know, born with the Enlightenment. Um, each person must use her own reason to decide for herself um, what she is to think, how she is to think. It's demolishing myths and customs as mere superstition, which are designed to maintain the status quo. And the French Revolution in its aftermath bring these enlightened ideas into the realm of reality. Each, each person is now a citizen with equal rights. Each human being could rise through her merits to the very top. And this, this is the claim being made by Giotto um, You know, he, he makes it, he, he, he makes it in a more subtle way. I'm just schematizing things, simplifying them somewhat, just for polemical reasons. And for Giotto the break that, that the French Revolution accomplishes produces a world that we recognize, a one whose claims actually seem you know, pretty self-evident to us. You know, we're no longer in a world in, in the West of hierarchy and tradition in the old sense, where everyone used to have a place and they knew it, you know, where everyone was a shoemaker, a playwright, a farmer. Uh, there's a, a more of a climate of, of equality in that respect, but there's no longer pre-assigned place or station we find in this period, in the Romantic period, poets emancipating themselves from patrons, um, from the older forms of poetry, and often linking themselves to vernacular forms of expression, to ordinary language, the language of ordinary people. In this period, there's, there's a sense in which the rules are no longer given as they were in the old sense. Uh, there's no longer a, a sense of e uh, being at ease with the tradition, uh, not for everybody. And for Joseph Vici, then, there are no simple craft rules anymore. The point I'd want to highlight here is that Joseph Vici identifies a, a crisis of authority with which we still live today, and this has already come up in discussion. No one's going to tell you how you should have to write. No one's going to tell you definitively what counts as success or failure um, in a particular stream of writing, a particular kind of writing. Standards by which to judge work are things which are quite hot, um, hotly contested. And indeed, you know, one of the things you have to do is to struggle against internalized standards. You know, that you, you, you internalize um, rules and norms that as a writer you have to break from in some way. So the idea is in this period, the period which we can understand it as modernism, as modernity, um, for many writers, there's a feeling in which we can't just repeat old forms. So what are we going to do? You know, what, what options are, are available to us? Let me put up another slide. Apologies for the delay here. So I'm putting up another slide in a moment. Oh, here we are, splendid. Okay, apologies for that. Um, right, I'll share my screen. Hopefully what you can see on the screen before you is a quotation from 
Claire Bajoskovici's book on trust. Um, yes, now, Wittgenstein writes in Zettel about two kinds of games. In one case, we make a move in an existing game. In the other, we establish the rules of the game. That, it seems to me, is Gabriel Yosbovici writing, that, it seems to me, succinctly summarizes the difference between the work of art before and after 1800. In earlier ages, the rules were given, the genres were known, and you worked within them. That is how Virgil, Dante, and Pope, utterly different as they were, all worked. In modern times, starting, say, with Beethoven, with Wordsworth, artists have had to invent or discover the game as well as play it. That is not easy. Some artists go on in the old ways, oblivious to the fact that it is no longer viable. A few embrace the new conditions with relish. Most struggle, finding some success every now and again, and a great deal of failure. So here is Joseph Pavici summarizing some of the points that, which I've been making um, on his behalf. And he's looking here, he's looking here to Wittgenstein, to the book Zettel. Zettel introduces this distinction between two kinds of games, the idea of making a move in an existing game, one that already exists, and another kind of game where we establish the rules of the game as we go along. And this, says Joseph Babici, summarizes the difference between the work of art before and after 1800. You know, before 1800, the rules were given, the genres were known, you worked within them. Virgil, Dante, and Pope, according to Joseph Babici, worked in those terms. With modernity, you have to invent or discover the game as you go along, and that is not easy. Some artists go along in the old ways, oblivious to the fact that the old ways are no longer viable. Some embrace the new conditions with relish, with excitement. Most struggle. I want again to turn to an exercise here to think of examples of creative writers who invent or discover the game as well as play it. And also to think of examples of creative writers who go on in the old ways. And let's cut this exercise down to 10 minutes rather than 15. So 10 minutes, some examples of writers who invent or discover the game as well as play it, and examples of creative writers who go on in the old ways.
Oh, a couple of minutes. So let's draw them to a conclusion. So I'm greatly looking forward to some examples here of, of rule breakers, rule makers, people who follow rules. Aaron care to volunteer some examples. Somebody hasn't spoken before. Hello, Lars. Alex, is that Alex? This is, yes. Okay, great, Alex. Well, so give me give me some examples then of um of authors who are rule changing or who set their own rules. Yes. Um, so as in my mind, uh, as I already discussed, we mentioned uh, Beckett and Blanchot, obviously. But I think another uh, major figure would be uh, Roger Laporte. Um, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, as, yeah especially in his uh, collected volume, Un V. Um, and I think this idea of breaking the rules while also sort of remaking them or uh, cha changing the game while playing it. Especially with these writers, it focuses a lot on the idea of the question of writing itself. What is writing and what's going on in the work of writing and how it tends to unwork itself. Yeah, it's fascinating. So the, the idea then of so, so Beckett and Blanchot, Roger Laporte, these writers are um, very interested in the idea of what writing is, what goes on in writing. I think, so I catch, did I catch it, do you, what, what, what is unworked by writing as well? Was that, was that the expression you used? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so what is, what is unworked, yeah. So, so writing here, I think these authors, are, it'd be fair to say that writing becomes something quite open-ended, no longer bound to you know, simple and straightforward way to closed forms becomes exploratory, it becomes, um, what, would the word, what would the word be to use here? I suppose this idea of unworking, of unworking form, of, un, um, of sending these, these, these old categories, making them more fluid, more open, something of this kind. So mm -hmm. this is what you find, Alex, in, in, in Beckett and Blanchot, in Laporte's work. Um, okay, thank you. Um, any, anyone else uh, get a volunteer some Hello? Names. Yeah, this is, who's this? Uh, Micah. 
Micah, okay, great. Thanks, Micah. Could I give an example of a rule uh, breaker? Please do, yeah. I was thinking of um, Louis Zukovsky. Okay. And um, he's, a, he's an objectivist poet associated with the Black Mountain School. And um, he has these translations of Catullus mm. where he um, gives priority to what he calls the breathing of Catullus over um, issues of how to manage the Latin syntax and um, into English syntax and stuff like that. And um, if you listen to it, it's like uh, it, it, you get this almost Fellini-esque mm, vision of, um, of Rome somehow projected from this priority that he's giving to the breath over. over this is very interesting too. Yeah. The priority to breath, what does that look like on the page? Are there, is it blank spaces? Is it, is it the way the text is spaced out? Um, no, it still has a kind of um, normal appearing form on the, on the page, but somehow I, I think he was talking about like the, um, almost like the, the spirit of, of, of Zukovsky, of, of Catullus's breathing, like how he would breathe when he would mm. be um, reciting his poetry that guided all of the other considerations of his translations. They're really interesting to listen to. You can listen to them on uh, Penn Sound. Uh, right, okay. Yeah. This, this is a fantastic tip. Thank you very much. I, I don't know the, um, those translations at all. They, they sound extremely interesting. And it's wonderful you can listen to these as well. That was on Penn Sound. Okay. Great. Uh, one more person to, to be an advocate of, 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 uh, of writers, perhaps writers we haven't heard of before. Uh, writers who you feel are marginalized, who, who need to be... Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to Go contribute. Ahead. Yeah, Eric, yeah. Um, I feel like uh, most of the writers, lyricists, um, are, are MCs that I um, am fond of and read and listen to. Um, so I feel like the people who are kind of stuck in the old ways are kind of, are the old generation, like Rakim or Redman mm -hmm. um, or like Royce the Five Nine. And that also comes into like the topic of content where like you can have an old way of doing things in an old style, but like you can still be current in the content, you know? And I think there's kind of like a merge of like an old style and like people who kind of like are inventive and like discover the game and play it as well, just to stay relevant, like Jay-Z and Nas and um, Childish Gambino and like newer people like Jaden Smith and like uh, Migos. And then there are the people who like have always been in the old world who are also innovating newer ways. It's funny because like Lupe Fiasco or like Red Man was like paired with Method Man in, in a group in the 90s, but then Method Man was still um, innovated in his complexities of writing and lyricism and content. Um, and then you get into like the newer generation of like the people who like pass away like Juice World or XXX who kind of like birthed this new generation of writers like Roddy Rich or Lil Baby or Bryson Tiller. But like along that same generation, you have like the Baby or Big Sean or YG who stick to that structured format of like old school structured 90s, early 90s. Um, so yeah, there's kind of complexities of like whether like it's form structure um, and like the layout of, of like your writing and then content and like innovating an old way into a new way um, without even being um, current in your content content, or vice versa. So you're thinking here about different generations of artists in rap. And for you, Rakeem um, is someone who has been left behind in some sense. If you listen to Rakeem's stuff, am I right that you're suggesting here it's, it's of its time, it's of the eighties, whereas we have innovators now who are working um, in, a, in, in form and structure in a manner which is inventive. It's reframed yeah. what's possible. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, but it's also like, as far as content, because Rakim is very, um, his, his style is very old and his content, even his new stuff is very old, but like you have Nas or Jay-Z who sound like Rakim, but their content is, is more current. There's a fresh content in some sense, a fresh content 
bursts the old forms. There's a vibrancy to it. Okay, this, this is extremely interesting. It's very interesting to think of this in terms of rap as well and the history of, of rap. It's a short history. Um, so there, there's things to think about there. And, and you know, as you say, people to listen to, J.D. Smith, the Migos, uh, Charles Bambino. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, now, I'd like to get a couple of examples here from people, people who appear to be very innovative, very new and fresh, but are actually doing something pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm really interested to see what examples you might come up with here. Uh, people who might seem to have vitality and freshness, but are actually doing something which has been done before, something traditional. So any thoughts at all, I'm really interested to see what you come up with. Hello. Hi, Aurelia. Hi. Um, it's, it's, it's good to be, um, to be with you all. Um, so I actually wanted to reflect a little bit on what seems to me like the, um, the exploitation of Wittgenstein by, um, by contemporary poets. And I've had the chance to, um, to write a little bit about this in relation to the um, uh, movement um, the, uh, known as language poetry here in America. Mm -hmm. And I found that there are poets who, um, well, let me just say this. I think it's, it's, it's an extraordinary movement, especially in its beginnings, the way they, um, they tried to challenge the conventions of what was known as a kind of very uh, already set tradition of lyric, expressive, confessional um, uh, tradition um, of poetry. And um, I think writers like Rosemary Waldrop, who uh, directly engage with Wittgenstein, I, I found it to be quite, quite interesting. Um, but the more, the more I read, and in fact, um, in the years after I, I wrote about that, I, I started seeing that, that Wittgenstein is suddenly everywhere and is being exploited literally in ways in which Wittgenstein himself would not have wanted to. <laughs> Uh, in fact, he would say, you know, this, this, this very appropriation of his words about language games in order to produce language games that are innovative is kind of playing by the old rules. <laughs> so, I, so I think there's, a, yeah. there's, a, there's kind of a, a, a the boundary is, is very unstable here. But I do believe there's value in, um, in really... Um, you know, the way these writers challenge themselves to write outside convention by uh, writing according to different uh, constraints, um, uh, sort of challenging yourself a little bit. And I think in that sense, it can be very valuable. Yeah, so that's very interesting. So the idea of, of challenging yourself using different constraints of um, building, maze, building a maze for yourself from which you can escape thinking here of the Ulipo movement. I've seen that, that's come up in the, in the chat uh, with Ulipo, um, you know, this was, this was the, 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 the manifesto. You build a, a maze from which you can escape in some sense, but it's important to work with a maze with constraints so that you can escape. And it's very interesting your points here on language poetry. As you say, you know, language poetry works against, it worked against the lyric, expressive, confessional poetry uh, that came before it. But one thing you're identifying here is a, is a conservatism about the way in which Wittgenstein is used by these and other poets. That actually there's a more complex relationship between rule breaking, rule making, following rules. Thank you for, for setting these thoughts in, in motion. It's very, very interesting. Okay, we'll, we'll, um, we'll move on a little bit further, if, if, if I may. Um, let me go back to my notes here. Um, so that was Wittgenstein, uh, as used by Jos Bovici. Um, for Jos Bovici, these opportunities that, that face the modern writer are exciting. He quotes T.S. Eliot, you know, the, the poet T.S. Eliot with approval. He quotes you know, this famous quotation from the Four Quartets, last year's words belong to last year's language and next year's words await another voice. This seems to go back to Eric's point here. Um, 
in last year's words, the words of Rakim, uh, and, and the, the form with, with which Rakim is working today, these are not another voice. But I think if, if I'm right, Eric, you are, you are contrasting um, Rakim here to other artists, um, to, to Naz, in which you find this other voice, a, a work, a, a way of writing which is always refreshing itself and opening itself up to this other voice. But you know, the thing about being a modern writer is it's also, it can be anyway, it can be lonely. This idea of being on our own as writers is something which it, it can be hard to cope with, the sense in which you're isolated or marginalized. Um, this came back to the point made by Annalise earlier that at graduate level, and I hope I'm not distorting anything you're saying here, Annalise, so do excuse me if I am, that at graduate level, you had a sense of your voice already. You knew the kind of stuff you wanted to write and you were ready at that stage then to do a creative writing course. But maybe there's a period in which you, you work alone and you, you're lonely, and which is a necessary part of becoming a, if I can use this you know, overloaded term, is an original writer in some way. That we have to break through um, this loneliness and reach out and connect with other people. The name Roger Laporte came up earlier, and you know, and, and Blanchot, and we know that these authors corresponded. And we know that Blanchot offered assistance to Roger Laporte in his writing. And when Roger Laporte was feeling very down and very low, Blanchot wrote a letter, and this letter has not been published. You know, there, there's only accounts of this, which is really frustrating for those of us who are interested in his work. They're, they're wonderful accounts of, um, by Roger Laporte's wife, uh, Jacqueline Laporte, of how Blanchot offered encouragement to Roger Laporte, how he told him that he too had been stuck, that he went for walks in inverted commas. Blanchot was thinking of drives he used to go on um, down, in, down in Nice. Uh, wonderful to think of these letters being written. So we, but, you know, there's a solitude. We, we, we need people to help us. Um, we need a period of loneliness, perhaps, but we need also a sense of, of being with other people. I want to move from Joseph Vicky now to another writer, a writer he never actually writes about, and this is the writer, you, you may know her work, um, Clarice Lispector. Clarice Lispector. She was born in the Ukraine. She was raised in Brazil, and she wrote in Portuguese, um, author of many novels, as well as, as sh many short stories. She wrote children's fiction and she wrote a whole bunch of newspaper articles. They're wonderful. I love the, the articles she published in the, um, in the newspapers from about 1967-73, because you get a real hodgepodge of wonderful things here. Aphorisms, diary entries, reminiscences, travel notes, stories and essays and interviews, all kinds of things. And these are called chronicles. This is a genre which is peculiar to Brazil. Um, they're addressed to a general audience. They're very varied, very unpredictable. There's a freedom to them. There's also a wonderful intimacy. I love this idea, this way of writing. And this is something which um, you know, I, I felt opened up with the internet, with the, with the blogging world. I was very much part of the, the blogging world back in the early 2000s. Um, and this for me is exactly what blog, the blogging world enabled. It enabled this, this freedom of, of, of writing, of, of exploration, but also an intimacy in your addressing, you're addressing a large a general audience, not necessarily a large audience, a general audience in quite an intimate way. I wanted to pick out one of these chronicles, which is from the 2nd of May, 1970. And it's a chronicle in which um, Inspector writes about her own experience of writing. And it's something which I, 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 I really find something very exciting about this, the, 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 these passages, and I hope that it connects with you as well. Um, so let me just put that up onto the screen and share this with you. So I hope my, I can master this, this, this whole business here. I can, great. This is my first ever Zoom teaching, so my apologies if I'm a little bit slow and rusty in the way I'm working here. Um, here we are. That's quite a long, quite a long slide this one. Here we are, yeah, okay, so. I'm gonna read this out to you. <clears throat> this is Clarice Spector, 1970. Writing for a newspaper is not so demanding. It is light, 
It must be light, even superficial. Those who read newspapers have neither the will nor time to read in depth. But to write something intended for a book often demands more strength than one seems to possess, especially if it means devising one's own writing habits, as in my case. When I consciously decided in my early teens that I wanted to become a writer, I immediately found myself in a void and there was no one to help or advise me. I had to emerge from that void to try and understand myself and to forge, as it were, my own truth. I made a start, but not even at the beginning. The sheets of paper began piling up. Nothing I wrote seemed to make any sense. My frustration as I struggled to write something worthwhile became one more obstacle in the path of success. What a pity I destroyed the interminable narrative I then started writing under the influence of Hermann Hesse's Steppenwolf. I tore it up, contemptuous of my almost superhuman efforts to master the craft of writing and come to terms with myself. And no one knew my secret. I did not tell a soul. I lived through that sorrow alone. One thing, however, did occur to me. It was important to carry on writing without waiting for the right moment because the right moment never comes. Writing has never been easy for me. I knew from the outset this was my vocation. Having a vocation is not the same as having talent. One can have talent and no talent. Sorry, one could have a vocation and no talent. In other words, feel compelled to write without knowing where to start. I just love these, these, these paragraphs. Sorry to gut in this way. I always find these extremely moving. I want to read this again and comment as, as, I, as, I, as I read. Hilary Suspecha, um, born in 1920, um, by this stage in her writing career, she is famous in Brazil. She is a very significant writer. And here she's recalling her early writing career. Her first novel was published when she was 23 years old. It began when she was 17. It's called Near to the Wild Heart. Clarissa Spector was someone who found a voice with which to write very early on, a very compelling and original voice that was recognized as such straight away um, in, in Brazil. It was widely reviewed. Here she's in 1970, a writer already very well known, very highly respected. And she's talking about doubt. She's talking about frustration. Writing for a newspaper is not so demanding. It is light. It must be light, even superficial. So Clarice Spector is writing in this light way for a newspaper. People haven't, who read newspapers haven't got time to read in depth. But to write for a book requires more strength. And this is wonderful formulation. It's more strength than you seem to possess. It reminds me of Kafka. Some of my famous, my favorite lines in Kafka, where he talks about what he calls the merciful surplus of strength. When Kafka was felt at his lowest ebb, when he's depressed and miserable, somehow he finds a strength to write. And in writing, he rings changes on that despair. He rings changes on, on that depression. And that writing gives him a new energy and transforms what he has written and makes it something which gives him strength. And here for Clarissa Spector, writing a book demands more strength than you possess, and yet you, you you, you, you write nonetheless in search of this strength, in search of this merciful um, sur surplus of strength. Especially if it means devising one's own writing habits, as in my case. She's devising her own writing habits. She's setting her own rules. The Spectre writes in a very unusual Portuguese. It's something which Benjamin Moser at the moment is trying to correct, correct in these new translations of her work. So she's writing in a new way. It's exciting the way she's writing. She's devising her own writing habits. But she tells us that when she consciously decided in my early teens that I wanted to become a writer, I found myself immediately in a void, in nothingness. There was no one to help or advise her. This is solitude. To go through this period of solitude, I had to emerge from that void to try to understand myself and forge my own truth. 
if you're a philosopher, you might roll your eyes at this expression, my own truth. But, you know, we're reading here a literary author of great philosophical profundity and richness, and you must learn from her. Her own truth is what she seeks. She makes a start and not even at the beginning. There's no beginning for her. She doesn't know where to begin or how to begin. The sheets of paper begin piling up. Nothing that she writes makes sense. There's frustration. She struggles to write something worthwhile. And this struggle itself becomes an obstacle. She sets it up as a kind of fetish. She wants to be original and wanting to be original itself becomes an obstacle. She destroyed this interminable narrative. We'll get this word again later on today, interminable. This interminable narrative. She started writing under the influence of Hermann Hesse, his book Steppenwolf. And she regrets tearing it up. She's contemptuous of her efforts, which are almost superhuman, to master the craft of writing. For Joseph Avicii, mastering the craft of writing is something we might set in opposition to the idea of, of the Spectre's attempt to write something worthwhile. We don't have to stick with Joseph Avicii's views here. We can form our own opinion, our own judgment here. But it's just interesting to note that, 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 that possible tension. She wants to come to terms with herself. And isn't this wonderful thing here, it'll resonate with what we're, what we're looking at um, in the second half of today's uh, session. And no one knew my secret. I did not tell a soul. I live without sorrow alone. Wonderful. She doesn't even tell you anyone about this. She didn't tell anybody. She lived through that sorrow, that, that, that difficulty on her own. But one thing she has occurred to her, it was important to carry on writing without waiting for the right moment. The right moment never comes. And then this formulation here, I find just glorious. Writing has never been easy for me. I knew from the outset, this was my vocation. Having a vocation is not the same as having talent. One can have a vocation and no talent. In other words, feel compelled to write without knowing where to start. I love those lines because this is a sense which many writers have, writers who well, I should say here, when would be writers, writers who want to write, the sense in which they feel called, they feel that writing is some kind of, is it a duty? Is that too grand a word here? They feel called in some way, they feel they have a vocation. I mean, it's not the same as having talent. It's not the same as actually having craft skills. You might want to write from an early age, but you don't really know how to write. You don't really know how to set off, what to do. You feel compelled to write, but you don't know how to start. And this, I, I feel, and maybe I'm wrong about this, captures the position of many people who want to write, who are young perhaps, or who have delayed um, things in life, who, who have been busy with other things and now want to begin to write. Vocation, but not talent yet. I would read this to students beginning um, their studies with me in creative writing. Uh, I, I always hope it resonates with them, give them a sense in which, okay, here in creative writing, we might be able to give you some of those skills that will help you unlock that vocation and, and allow you to write. So that's a quotation I wanted to share with you, which I think crystallizes some of these ideas that we find in Joseph Avicii, but in a, in a different way, um, in, a, in a different sense. That's what Clarice Spector is doing here. Let me just move on here. Um, you know, what I'd like for you to do, and this is something which, which will take a bit of time, um, is to construct a biography for yourself, your own writer's biography, where what you're thinking about, and I hope this, this is useful for you, what you're thinking about is the interplay of vocation and talent in your own life and work. But what you're doing is describing frustrations and breakthroughs concerning writing that you experienced. So once again, I'm thinking here of something modeled on the Spectre's writing style, the way she's doing things. What you're recounting here, in a general sense, is your biography as a writer, and it might well be the case that as with the first people I spoke to today, um, Adira, um, I'm thinking of you and, and Christian, you know, it may be that you haven't, you know, you don't feel you've anything substantial yet. But nevertheless, construct this biography and tell us about what you might want to write in the future. Um, others you know, in the group have actually written many things before and have, you know, have even studied you're writing at graduate level. So please begin writing your, your writer's biography. Um, 250 words is the word limit. 
So what this should occupy you for the next half an hour, and perhaps it should occupy you, if you have any time at all, in the break following this session. Now, what I propose to do is actually to um, spend 20 minutes of this on this exercise, and we have 10 minutes at the end of today's session, just to pull things together and ask you some of your experiences in writing this piece. Let, let me try and clarify this. I'm, I'm being very unclear, I think. Um, I recommend spending 30 minutes on this exercise. Because we have time constraints, there's always there's never enough time in these workshops. Please spend 20 minutes now on this exercise and perhaps spend 10 minutes after the um, hour, two hours have, have finished um, rounding up what you're writing. I won't ask you to read this 250 words. So that's my lengthy preamble. Um, over to you.
So a couple more minutes. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll stop there for this exercise. You can resume that in the hour break, if that's useful. What I'd like to do is to get some um, thoughts from, from people, perhaps somebody who hasn't spoken before. I've been reading the chat as well, which is extremely interesting. Very interesting things going on there. <clears throat> Any reflections from people who are screenwriters and playwrights on, on their own writing process, on... on how you might understand your own relationship to craft, to failure, and these kinds of issues. Screenwriting or drama, anyone from those backgrounds at all? Hey Lars, this is Shalini. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, hey, Sally. Uh, uh, so I just want to uh, talk about my uh, autobiography. Mm -hmm. So I'm an engineer by uh, profession. I was I was trained to be an engineer, and in 2018 uh, I quit my job to pursue full time writing. So I I come from a, a southern southern state of India, and my mother tongue is very very influential but I write in English. So uh, there, ha there was always a trouble with uh, writing in English because the mother tongue was so influential on me. So, so what um, was, your, was, your mother, was your mother tongue Tamil or? Malayalam. Ah, Malayalam, yes, okay. Yes, it's right. It's very influential and I, I used to write in Malayalam when I was uh, young. So uh, shifting to uh, English was kind of a difficult thing for me. And I was, um, so I was, uh, I, I started writing in English, uh, baby steps first. I started uh, with short stories. And uh, as I quit my job, it was uh, kind of a big uh, um, pressure on me to write because I, I was writing full time now. So, uh, so the, the, the fear of failure, whether I'll be able to pull it off writing in English so it, it's, it was there and it's still here. But uh, I think in a way that writing, whether it's in, mother, it's in my mother tongue or it's in English, has always been my vocation. I wanted to write. That was very clear. So, uh, so after I quit my job, my experience has been very difficult because uh, I have been thrown into an entirely different world of writers and uh, you know, nothing common with my friend circle or my uh, surroundings. So um, it was, it's a real new experience and a very scary experience because I have no, absolutely no training in, in writing. 
Uh, but I think uh, feeling that it is my vocation gives me the strength to um, kind of uh, face everything, even if even if it's not a big uh, you know steps I'm taking or big break breakthroughs I'm making. I think um, the feeling of it's being it's going to be my life is giving me the strength. I'm not looking at the result in two or three or five years. I'm looking at an uh, entire lifetime of writing. So that that gives me the strength to go ahead and uh, write. I, I'm, I'm still not sure whether it's, I'm going to get a great breakthrough, but I know that I'm going to write every day. So, so that, 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 uh, that again gives me a lot of happiness and a lot of uh, kind of, you know, it, it's, it's more of uh, uh, staying true to yourself thing for me mm. rather than staying in a job which I don't like. So, so that, that's my journey. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. This is very interesting. So, um, you know, writing something which has led you to quit a secure job, there's now a fear of failure. You, you are um, writing full time. Uh, but nevertheless, it's something which also for you is brings you brings you joy, not necessarily because you think there's a, a breakthrough which is imminent, but because you're doing something which you feel could sustain you, could sustain you as an activity throughout for the rest of your life. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of living, it's a yes, way of being. Yes. This is extremely interesting. I just just a final question here. This is a very moving testimony you're giving. Is your move from Malayam to English is fascinating. What, what made you um, want to move um, from from Malayam? So, uh, like in India, we have a lot of regional languages. So when I went to study, most of my uh, friends were uh, non non Keralaites, so they don't speak my language. They, we we all speak a common language that is English. So mm. I wanted to connect with a larger audience in India, which was not possible through my mother tongue. So. Uh, the things I want to write is still local to my native, but I wanted to express it in a different medium so that it can reach more and more people. Thank you. So this, this is, this is uh, very interesting. Okay, so English as a national language um, allowed you to communicate to a, a, a larger audience, and especially to people you've met. This is very yes. interesting. So it is a way of overcoming a solitude and overcoming... Um, uh, a, a writing which, which, which only be which might only be intelligible to people living in Kerala. So you're looking for a, a, a way through a larger audience. But actually, what's interesting here, what's quite moving, is the idea of overcoming solitude through writing, overcoming um, you know, this this particularity. Um, a writer called Georges Bataille, a French writer, and he he addresses some of his books to unknown friends. Which again, I've also found very moving the idea of. His books are, are addressed to unknown friends. You know, during the war years, during the World War II, he was, he was living in, in occupied France. He was writing in solitude, and he felt deserted by and betrayed by many of his friends. He'd been involved in all these political endeavors in the late 1930s. Um, and he wrote these books, who to? To unknown friends, to unknown people. And I always found that very moving, the idea of writing as communication. But I think we, we should draw our session to a, to a close. And we'll take our hours break. Please do continue if you have time to, to write your, your biographies and we'll resume at seven o'clock. So thanks very much. And the, the discussion in the, in the chat is extremely interesting. One will see some writers like um, in the port there. I really enjoyed seeing Maggie Nelson's name coming up um, several, several occasions. Earl Sweatshirt's work, I greatly admire. I was actually even gonna bring it up earlier and um, didn't I only, I only know one album by him. Um, which I greatly admire. And I believe we have uh, an expert in Portuguese, uh, Mariana, in the audience. Um, uh, this, you, know, you will understand um, the spectre you know, far better than I ever could. So I hope I've done her justice. So, so um, I hope I haven't embarrassed myself. And I hope the translation that I'm working with is decent. It's been retranslated that particular passage by Benjamin Moser and his biography. It's, you know, it's a different feel, but I thought I'd go with that because you know, it's, it's um, this wonderful book. Some of you asked you know, where, the, where, where this book, uh, where you can get hold of this book. It's Discovering the World. It's from 1992 by, from Carsonet. I imagine it'll be coming out again in a new translation for those of you who 
for those of us who don't read Portuguese, are coming out soon again, a new translation, as part of this wave of translations that are coming out, overseen by Benjamin Moser. So thank you very much, and, and I'll see you all again in an hour's time. Okay, cheerio now. <clears throat>
Um, I'd started working full time as a teacher too. So I didn't have time. I was lacking time. So the only thing I was writing during that time was poetry. And um, I'd attended several graduate schools that did um, where they taught, um, I mean, I was among people who did creative writing, but I wasn't doing it. I was like part of an English department that there were people who did creative writing, but I wasn't in that segment of people. Uh, but I knew them and I heard about their literary magazines. And eventually when I hit um, my final, after, after some time I'd figured out how to construct a, a book myself, like a real actual tangible book. I'd figured out how to self publish. And I made my own, uh, I compiled all of the poetry that I'd gotten and I compiled my first um, self published book. And I just kept kind of doing that. And now I have um, 25 of them. <laughs> um, and I also discovered I could write um, children's books and translations and that I was more drawn less to the novel form and more to the children's book form, like me in first grade, <laughs> you know, <laughs> writing my little um, coloring, uh, I mean, um, children's book and um, I then started doing something else too. I started trying to publish other people's work. And that was really interesting for me because I, um, I'd never really know what goes into like where something falls in like a literary magazine. So I put on this facade, I went online, I searched for people, I put together a literary magazine and voila, I had a literary magazine, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, now it's in like its sixth issue and I still respond to people like as if I were like a whole group of mm -hmm. editors even though there's just really one of me um, and so that's kind of been the trajectory of my writing curse thus far and I feel like I'm moving more and more or less into like being the actual creator of or writer and more into like more of the curator of other people's works mm. um and it's strange because i never know how to negotiate between the academic side of like who i want to become as an academic and who i want to become as a writer and those have always been like somehow interchangeable but also the same thing um so yeah that's my writer's thanks. story thanks very much that's fascinating uh Sorry. That, uh your relationship to these complete works is, is quite remarkable that you were very young, you wrote your first book, then you had eight complete novels a bit later, you know, later on. So you're someone who is able to finish a project and, and bring it to term and say, that's a novel, that's done. This is, this is, um, this is very impressive, to be able to finish a work in this way. And uh, you talk also about this, this, the sixth issue of your journal and you're writing out as if you were a whole group of editors. I love this idea that you're writing out as if you were a collective, people sitting around looking at people's work and discussing it together and saying, should we publish this or not publish this? What, should, what sort of advice should we give? And the, I think what you're, you're giving me a sense here of um, an element of role play in all of this. There's role play in the sense, you know, uh, we, we, present ourselves, we can present ourselves as authors, um, as academics, as editors, you know, there's a part of this which is, um, what would the expression be? Some kind of uh, feeling out something which isn't quite there. You know, you're, you're, we are um, inhabiting a role that we don't quite possess. We don't have a, a full claim, this position as being, being an author, a position of being an editor. Um, so we, we lack this full claim of what it is we're doing. And we feel, with respect to it, a sense of lack of distance, um, that we're not quite who it is we're supposed to be. So the notion of writing here, you know, links to me with, um, again, respect his idea of vocation. It's a calling, something we're called towards. Are we ever actually there? Do we, actually, do we ever actually achieve it? Do we ever, do we ever actually step into this role as, as writer, or you know, in your case, as academic? But thanks very much for your for your um, your biography. Um, one more person, I'd love to hear from someone we haven't heard from before. Anyone else care to? to volunteer here, to step up. Thank you, um, Andrea. Yes, hi. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure you're referring to me and not the other Yes, Andrea. indeed, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to speak about um, failure and, and isolation <laughs> through um, mm. an experience I had when I was writing my MFA thesis. So I'm, I don't consider myself a, a, a writer, but I am a dancer and a choreographer who engages with writing. And I write choreographic scores that um, I create through these like really long sessions of moving and talking or moving and writing at the same time, trying to kind of oscillate between the three things. And I <clears throat> was engaging this kind of writing technology uh, while I was writing my thesis. And what ended up coming through was like these really long, semi-incoherent like forms of flow. And um, I was like, how, how can I work with this material and sort of look back? Because in a choreographic sense, you would look back at the material and kind of extract sections that pertain to sort of like a movement affect or some kind of imagery and then create this sort of collage that would become the, the score. So I was like, well, how can I use this process to write a paper, like an, a more academic paper? So <laughs> I uh, somehow convinced my advisor to let me do this, but I was, I was doing these uh, public editing sessions where I would be performing with this like projection of sections of my text that I already written and beside it, this kind of commentary space, but it was all sort of moving through real time. So it was kind of like George Lucas style, like text moving along a projected mm. screen. And, and, and I, would, I would edit and invite others to contribute um, and dance and move within these sort of different frames, um, sort of choreographic frames. So it was a bit of a like engagement with failure in a very public way, <laughs> even though it was like very generative. Um, and then also just kind of like, I wanted to share this because it spoke to the sense of isolation and actually working with a sort of polyvocity. So bringing in other, other voices into the, into the editing process, which was, um, just, it was interesting for me and very rich and also confusing. <laughs> yes, this is fascinating. It's the idea that um, writing here is open-ended. It's a process. Uh, it's something which involves playing with failure, you know, risking yourself, you're, you're, you're dancing, you're, you're moving in real time. This idea of, that, um, of polyvocity, the many voices so your editing process is something which occurs not just because you know you decide to edit your work in a certain way, it's in it's in dialogue with other people. So you, there's an element of risk here, open-endedness. I love this phrase you use, semi-incoherent forms of flow. Uh, I found this very interesting. This idea of flow. We've always talked about this idea. It's, it's important to access flow. This was a notion which came from our first discussion. Christian, I think it came up in, in, in relation to you, your work, that what you're trying to access is some kind of flow. Flow, open-endedness is risk. The philosopher Kierkegaard says that we, we live forwards, but we understand backwards. So we live forwards, but we understand backwards. This is um, Kierkegaard, a 19th century Danish philosopher. We live forwards, we're not sure where our living is, is, is heading, or what direction of it is. We understand retrospectively. We understand something which has happened before us. We live forwards, we project, we um, look backwards to understand what's happened to us. We reject, you know, this is not really a, a use of the word reject that anyone would use, but um, it's only once we've, we've lived something we, we understand and grasp it. So your writing, Andrea, is on, is on the edge of, um, of newness, of originality, of openness. It's retrospectively, you understand what you've done. This is, this is a very interesting account of how failure is something you incorporate into your, into, into your work. I shouldn't really say failure, because who is here to judge what, what fails and what doesn't? It's, it's the risk of failure. Um, it's the risk of not knowing exactly what it is you're doing. Let's have one more person, please, to, to share your, share your, 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 your um, 
writer's journey, your writer's story. <clears throat> Anyone care to, to volunteer? <clears throat> Mariana, yeah, please, yeah, please. Well, actually, I'm not really a writer myself. Uh, I, I, I am a, an academic. Uh, it's really hard for me to put stories, to put things in words. Um, I love theories. I teach theories at the university. I work with theories. And I also love rules because I am an autistic. And then I really need rules to live. Uh, but because I have this kind of mathematical kind of brain, uh, I found out that I could kind of write. And then I decided that uh, I have a background in languages and, uh, and literature. And then I decided working with electronic literature. And now I develop a system that generates, um, not really, I, uh, I work with the development of a narrative uh, model to be applied to a system that generates narratives, uh, short stories actually in Portuguese. And then uh, this is how I'm writing. I'm writing through to a system, to the computer. So there I can use my, create, my, my creativity and also my mathematical skills. Uh, but then the problem that I am experiencing at the moment is the lack of of course, lack of humanity, but lack of emotion of my, of the output of my writing. And uh, actually this, uh, this workshop, I'm, I'm here more like to understand the, the writing process and see what, from, from this process, what can I transform into algorithm for my system to, to learn to write better? Let's put it this way. And yeah, and then it's pretty much my experience with writing. I, I write essays and then it's okay because they have a structure, so they are really easy for me. I, I write and then I put it there in that format and it's great. But the creative writing is through computational creativity, actually. <laughs> Extremely interesting. The computational creativity the creation of algorithms that would allow you to generate writing in some sense. Yep. Um, this is extremely unique. This is very, you know, unique as a, as a, I've never come across this, anything like this before. And you're, you are yourself on the autistic spectrum. So you're someone who has this ability to work mathematically. Um, you like to work within rules. You're producing an algorithm, which is a, you know, a rule-based way of, of, of proceeding. And you're someone who you're, you're very comfortable working with theory. This is extremely interesting. And what you're, what one of the things you said there was a lack of emotion. I think I think I'm, I'm right in saying that you felt that you want to understand the creative process. You want to understand something about emotion. Did, did I write that down properly? Did, did I get that? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm living in the Netherlands, and I'm mm. I'm having a. I'm having my PhD from the University of Coimbra, but I'm having an internship at the University of Tilburg at the Department of um, Communication and Cognition. And they have a, a project that, that they are developing a, a, a computational model of affection. So they are trying to see if, if they can model affection into computers. So I'm going to see if I can use the model they are developing into my system to see, uh, because uh, technically the system can, uh, of course, the format, uh, they, they can choose characters, they can choose, the, the system can choose uh, like the, the storyline, but they are very, in the end, they are pretty much like the writing of a seven, between five, seven year old kid. There is a beginning, middle, and end. Characters, things happen, but it's just that. Uh, then it's not deep enough, and I'll usually no, not emotion at all. It's, and then I, I yeah. was trying to find a model of narrative that I could. Uh, the computer could choose uh, an action, 
and uh, a response for that action, but based on emotions. So if, if some character does something, what would be the emotional response of the other of the other character? That's what I'm trying to do at, at the moment. This is the point I am in my, my PhD research. Okay, so it's the question here of um, the emotional richness of the story the computers are writing. Yeah. At, at present, the story the computers are writing at the level of a five to seven year old. They yeah. lack a, an emotional dimension. And the question yeah. for you is, how can that be? How can that be breathed into this computer work? How can we inspire this computer work with something genuinely emotional, which has emotional richness, emotional depth? It's with emotions that stories become involving, that we become involved in them. We want to read them, but we want to continue. Well, this is, this, this is really a fascinating story. And one I'll certainly remember, I've never heard of um, the idea of computational modeling of, of, of narrative writing. So this is something to think about and uh, yeah. I hope to return to that, um, and think about that again. Wonderful, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll turn now to um, another slide on my PowerPoint. Um, so let me just call this right up. And it's a text that some of you might have heard of before. You might know this, you might have read it. In fact, it might be a text that is already something of, of a favorite of yours, it's certainly a favorite of mine. Let me now, uh, it's right up on the screen. Hmm. And the text is, is a famous one. It's uh, by Maurice Blanchot, and it's called A Primal Scene. So this is one some of you will already be very, very familiar with. Um, let me just bring this right up now. This is a text by Maurice Blanchot. Blanchot um, was born in 1907, died in 2003, a French writer, and a writer famous for his discretion. He's not someone who spoke about himself, who wrote about himself, gave only, gave only one interview in his life. No photographs of him existed in, in, in public circulation. I was someone who worked for many years on Blanchot in my own appalling way. I tried to write things on Blanchot and, and fail miserably. I, but nevertheless, you know, I, I had a fascination with Blanchot's work. I never saw a photograph of him until about 2005, after he died. And the person he'd been writing on for all these years, the person he'd been fascinated with, never saw a photograph of him. And suddenly, 2005, I still remember it, I saw this photograph of Blanchot for the first time um, as a, as a middle-aged man. It was really quite overwhelming. So Blanchot, in other words, here, this is the point I want to make, was someone who didn't write about himself. He was someone who was famous as a, a writer of literary criticism. Um, he published monthly um, essays, which just about everybody read in, in, in philosophy, people like Deleuze and Derrida. And they, they, they knew Blanchard's work extremely well, Foucault, um, extremely influential and important figure. So he wrote, he wrote literary criticism, and he also wrote fiction. He wrote novels, he wrote what he calls recis, uh, the, these, are, these are shorter form works of fiction. He went on to write fragmentary fiction, which mixed uh, philosophical speculation, literary theory, and, and, um, and fiction in, in his later work. He never really wrote much about himself. In 1976, the philosopher Philippe Le Coulibart wrote to Blanchot to request a one page text for a new journal that he, Le Coulibart, was publishing. Two weeks later, in the post came this text by Maurice Blanchot. The reason why I give you this background is to, just, to, to say just how unusual it was for Blanchot to, 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 to write anything which was obviously autobiographical. So this is this, is this text here. And Le Coup Bart was, was overjoyed to receive this text. Uh, he felt this was the first time Blanchot had really revealed something of himself in, in, in public. So Blanchot, Maurice Blanchot, this famous French writer. 1976, Blanchot, by that stage, he's 69 years old. He's someone who's um, 
not going to write many more large pieces of work. He's retreated from his literary criticism. He's not writing fiction in the way he once was writing fiction. He's still writing, not a great deal. He suffered, you know, he's suffering from various kinds of illness. He, he, you know, he's having a, a very tough time in general. He lived for many more years. But this is a text which was really revelatory to people who, who enjoyed his work. Um, it was quite a startling work. And Blanchot republished it four years later in the collection of fragments fragmentary writing is called The Writing of the Disaster. So that's by way of a background, this text that I put up on the screen. I want to read through it, first of all. <clears throat> oh. Yeah. Uh, what was going on here? Excuse me. Yeah, a primal scene. You who live later, close to a heart that beats no more. Suppose, suppose this. The child, is he seven years old or eight perhaps, standing by his window, drawing the curtain and through the pane, looking. What he sees, the garden, the wintry trees, the wall of a house. Though he sees no doubt in a child's way, his play space, he grows weary and slowly looks up toward the ordinary sky with clouds, gray light, pallid daylight without depth. What happens then? The sky, the same sky, suddenly open, absolutely black and absolutely empty, revealing as though the pain had broken, such an absence that all has since always and forevermore been lost therein so lost that therein is affirmed and dissolved, the vertiginous knowledge that nothing is what there is, and first of all, nothing beyond. The unexpected aspect of this scene, its interminable feature, it's the feeling of happiness that straight away submerges the child. The ravaging joy to which he can bear witness only by tears, an endless flow of tears. He is thought to suffer a childish sorrow, Attempts are made to console him. He says nothing. He will live henceforth in the secret. He will weep no more. A primal scene. Let me just comment on this. I'll read through it again and comment as I go. A primal scene with a question mark. The word primal scene should be familiar to us from psychoanalysis, from the work of Sigmund Freud. The idea of a primal scene first crops up in, in Freud's work in 1895, he doesn't publish this. Freud is exploring the patients who he's, he's working with. He's exploring with them their past memories. And what strikes Freud in 1895, he's still only, how old is he then, 30 years old? What strikes Freud in that period is that there seems to be a trauma. There seems to be a trauma that lies behind neurotic symptoms his patients are exhibiting. There seems to have been something that occurred that still held sway over his patients in the present. So what Freud thinks, he's still a young man, he's 30 years old, I think. That's right, isn't it? Maybe not. Anyway, roughly 30 years old, he's still a young man. He thinks to himself, there's something which lies behind these neurotic symptoms. And what he calls this thing that lies behind is a primal scene. Freud is fascinated by this idea of a primal scene, of tracing everything back to a determinate origin. In 1897, he wonders whether, in fact, there's a literal primal scene, whether something literally lies behind the neuroses of his patients. Until this point, over the two years of work, he's been thinking to himself, there is some kind of sexual trauma it is common to all my patients who are exhibiting neurotic symptoms. There's a sexual trauma here. This trauma does not mean simply, you know, the abuse, sexual abuse of a child. It means some relationship to sexuality which puzzles and confuses young children. Young children can't really take in what's happening when they experience sexual episodes, when they see something sexual happening 
they feel sexual thoughts. They're not really sure what's happening. They haven't got a vocabulary for this. 1897, Freud's still wondering about this, still thinking about it. The, word, the notion of a primal scene still occupies him. He talks about it in private. He talks about it in correspondence. He talks about it to Carl Jung. Carl Jung himself to become a very famous psychoanalyst. As Carl Jung says in the early 19th century, Carl Jung says, what if our patients are simply retrospectively fantasizing? What if our patients didn't really have a primal scene of any kind at all? These primal scenes, these so-called primal scenes are just retrospective fantasies. What if they're not real? And Freud thinks maybe Jung's right. Maybe they're not quite real in any obvious sense. Maybe he's puzzled. In 1910, Freud takes as a patient, a young Russian nobleman, very wealthy person. This young nobleman is someone who comes to Freud with various problems with his intestines. He, he experiences great pain, stomach pains. He's someone who's haunted by a dream, a dream he first had when he was four years old, a dream of wolves. I'm going to read that wolf, that, that dream to you. This is from Sarge uh, Pakenjev talking to Freud. I dreamt that it was night and that I was lying in my bed. My bed was stood with its foot towards the window. In front of the window, there was a row of old walnut trees. I know it was winter when I had the dream and nighttime. Suddenly the window opened of its own accord and I was terrified to see that some white wolves were sitting on the big walnut tree in front of the window. There were six or seven of them. The wolves were quite white and looked more like foxes or sheepdogs for they had big tails like foxes and they had their ears pricked up like dogs when they pay attention to something. In great terror, Evidently of being eaten up by the wolves, I screamed and woke up. I always find that a very beautiful dream, incredibly unearthly, and very moving. This is the dream of the person nicknamed by Freud, the Wolfman. The Wolfman, that's what he's called. Sajay uh, Bakunjev, he's a, a, a young Russian nobleman. He meets Freud in 2010. They have analysis sessions until 2000. 2010, 1910 was what I mean here, sorry. 1910, they have, they have analysis sessions until 1914. In 1914, Freud proclaims to Sarge Pankajev, the so-called Wolfman, that he has solved the issue and that he understands finally what the dream was all about, the dream of wolves in the walnut tree, the dream of the wolves outside the window. Freud thinks he's understood what these dreams are about. And what they are about is something that the Wolfman himself witnessed when he was no more than 18 months old. And what he witnessed was his parents having sex. He saw his parents having sex, lovemaking. He was 18, 18 months old and he could not frame this experience. He couldn't understand this experience. What sort of thing was happening between his parents were they being aggressive? Were they being violent? What was happening here? Was there pleasure? Freud wrote about this, this, um, this, this case study in 1918. He published a, a, a volume on this um, from the history of an infantile neurosis. And in that document, what Freud does is take you through the course of the analysis. It's rather like a detective novel. It's quite exciting to read. Freud is working out exactly what troubles this young Russian nobleman. What is it that lies behind his neurotic symptoms? Why is it, as the nobleman said, that in his adulthood, he always felt that he lived behind a veil? A primal scene. This refers for Freud to that witnessing by an 18 month year old child of his parents having sex. An experience that the child could not undergo, and this is the crucial point here, could not undergo in the first person, could not take in, could not process. And this experience thereafter haunted him. This experience 
lay at the root of the neurotic symptoms. So for Freud, the case has been solved. In 1918, he publishes this document, A History of Infantile Neurosis, in which he, Freud, claims to have solved this problem. As part of this book, it's about 150 pages long, there's a lot, a lot of it, Freud admits doubts about the primal scene. He's not sure whether it actually happened or not. But he overcomes these doubts and he says, it did happen. It really did happen. The problem is, his patient says, I can't remember it. I can't remember anything about my parents, seeing my parents having sex. I can't remember anything about that situation. And you know what? This young Russian nobleman has problems for the rest of his life with his, with his intestines, with strange kinds of flashback to his childhood, with iterations of this, of this dream about wolves. He remains the wolf man. Freud does not solve these problems. So what then does Freud do? Freud is fascinated by the primal scene. He writes about it for the first time in, in that case study, which was published in 1918. It's the first time Freud write, wrote about this, this case study. The primal scene is always something which is somewhat enigmatic in Freud's work. But Freud himself. Now Freud goes on to, to identify a peculiar form of temporality in the relationship to the primal scene. A peculiar form of temporality, which in English we, we call deferred action. Uh, in German, it's, it's Nachtreiblichkeit. Deferred action, we call it in German. Afterwardness is another possible translation. The idea is that these traumas reveal themselves subsequently, not at once. There are things we undergo that we, we have no way of understanding or framing. Their secret is revealed to us. Is it revealed, actually? Perhaps it is never revealed to us. Let, let me put it this way. Their secret is intimated to us later flashbacks and dreams we're not sure what happened something happened but what was it that happened what was it that occurred we're not sure this is something which runs through freud's work and psychoanalysts following freud think about this idea of a primal scene as well in their work now what blanchard did when he published this this fragment here in 1976 in Philippe Le Coulibart's journal, what Blanchot did was to entitle his, his, his fragment, this, this story here, he entitled it A Primal Scene with No Question Mark. When he republished it in the writing of the disaster, when he republished it with other fragments in 1980 in the book called The Writing of the, of the Disaster, Blanchot added this, this question mark, which makes it even more interminable. We're not even sure what happened. And this indeed reflected Blanchot, Blanchot's own writings about Freud, which began a lot earlier. So Blanchot first wrote about Freud, I think. Maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't be so old and saying when he first wrote about Freud. But a notable essay appeared, I think it was early 50s, late 60s, uh, early 50, late, 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And in that text, he notes that Freud had an obsession with the origin of tracing things back to an origin something which was there, which was present, which you could be certain of. Freud felt that all the neuroses of his patients could be traced back to an origin, but the problem for Freud is that idea of an origin dissolved into something indefinite. There's always an origin behind the origin, behind the origin, behind the origin, and Freud could never find his way back to anything that really satisfied him. In 1918, in his case study of the Wolfman. Freud claims to have solved the Wolfman's neurosis, but he hadn't. This idea of a primal scene haunts him. So Blanchard writes his fragment and he calls it a primal scene question mark. Because I think for Blanchot, this idea of a primal scene that's present, that actually occurred, is something which is, we can never really grasp, we can never understand. We can never really pin it down. It retreats into an indefinite anteriority. So, a primal scene question mark. We move on. You who live later, close to a heart that beats no more, suppose, suppose this. A framing is occurring. The scene has been framed as a primal scene question mark. 
scene which seems to collapse into an indefinite anteriority, which never seems to rest upon anything present or solid or certain. Another framing occurs in the next sentence. You who live later, we are the addressees of this text, close to a heart that beats no more, post, close to a scene of death, the death of this author, of Blanchot. Suppose, suppose this. We to suppose something, not to claim that it happened. We're asked to think about it as if it happened. We're not sure whether it's real, whether it's autobiographical. For Philip Nicola Bart, who published this, this, this fragment, it was certainly autobiographical. But we're not sure about this as readers of this text in, in, in the writing of a disaster. It seems to stand on the edge of fiction and autobiography. So this, this is technically being framed in various ways. It's being framed as a primal scene, question mark. It's being framed as something we come across, we who live later, who reach Blanchot posthumously. It's being framed as something which is fictional, question mark, autobiographical, question mark. What exactly is going on? Well, I want to turn this mystery over to you. Um, I'm going to make a couple more comments here. I'm going to turn it over um, to you to think about and write about. Let me just draw out a couple of points here. The child, is he seven years old or eight perhaps? What's the significance of this age? Standing by his window, drawing the curtain and through the pane looking, looking through a pane, a kind of framing is occurring. What he sees, the garden, the wintry trees, the wall of a house. An ordinary scene, a banal scene, an everyday scene. Though he sees no doubt in the child's way his play space, he grows weary and slowly looks up toward the ordinary sky with clouds, gray light, pallid daylight without depth. He grows weary. And this weariness draws his, his, his sight upwards He's looking into the sky, but what is there to see in the sky? Nothing. It's an ordinary sky. There's no depth in the sky. Grey light, clouds, ordinary, banal. And then something occurs. Something extraordinary occurs in this life of this child. The sky, the same sky, no different than before, is open. Suddenly, suddenly open. It breaks open, black and empty. Absolutely black and absolutely empty, not relatively black, not relatively empty, absolutely black and empty, revealing as though the pain had broken, as although something's been, some frame has been shattered, the windows have been shattered, revealing as though that had happened. Such an absence that all has since, always and forevermore, been lost therein, an absence, a lack, so lost that therein is affirmed and dissolved the vertiginous, the dizzying knowledge that nothing is what there is. And first of all, nothing beyond, nothing beyond, nothing transcendent, nothing up in the sky there. The sky is not full of stars, nothing beyond, just blackness, just void. Listen to how this resonates with, with the spectre. I always find this magical. The unexpected aspect of this scene, it's interminable feature. Remember that Lispector wrote about the interminability of her writing project, of writing Steppenwolf. The interminable feature, a feeling of happiness. There's joy here. It's not just suffering, there's joy. The straightaway submerges the child, a ravaging joy, a joy that doesn't leave him intact, that doesn't spare him, which you can only witness through tears. He's crying, he's weeping, an endless and interminable flood of tears. Attempts are made to console him because he's thought to suffer a childish sorrow. He's only a boy of seven or eight. And listen now, listen, look at this now, like, like the spectre. He says nothing. Just like the spectre, he will live henceforth in the secret. Has, has Blanchet been reading the spectre? It seems unlikely. It seems unlikely. He will weep no more. So close to the spectre, this idea of solitude, of the solitary. So what I'd like you to do is work with this wonderful and very rich text. A writing exercise of 15 minutes, where you consider this scene along the same lines as you considered Lispector's account of her beginning to write. 
I want our understanding of this text to be framed in terms of what we've been discussing in the previous two hours with Joseph Avicii and with Clarice Spector. That we want, I want to understand this scene as an account of beginning to write. Um, there's a wonderful book written by Christopher Finsk, Professor Finsk of um, the European Graduate School, which is called um, Infant Figures. If I was on screen at the moment, I'd wave that at you, this book. And this book is, is a really fantastic response to the primal scene. I, I, I recommend that book to you. Um, I think Fins, Christopher Finsk's uh, argument, that this is, this is a scene concerned with the origin of language, a scene concerned with the entry of long show into language or any writer into language is, is the right interpretation. I think it resonates this primal scene very strongly with the Spectre. To think then about what we've said earlier about vocation and solitude and authority, all the other stuff that arose in our earlier discussions. Think about the boy's age, think about the broken window pane, think about the emptiness of the sky. Think about the child, child's response, his, his happiness, his tears of joy. Think about all of this and just write what occurs to you. Perhaps you're gonna write about your own experience as a writer. Perhaps you're going to isolate some scene that's been very important to you as a writer, some episode. Write in response to this text. Do not feel bound by it, governed by it. See this text as an invitation to produce something creative and exciting of your own. So 15 minutes then, not, a long, not, not much time, but 15 minutes to try and to, to respond to this text by coming up with a scene of your own which circles around some of these issues that we've been discussing.
So I guess we'll uh, call things to a halt there. Hmm. So I'm greatly looking forward to seeing how you respond to the text. <clears throat> It'd be great to hear from someone who hasn't, who hasn't uh, spoken before. Anyone care to volunteer to talk about how they respond to the text? I'm not asking you to read your work. I'm asking you to respond to your strategies, how you responded, um, what kind of things you found yourself writing. Um, can I respond? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the piece reminded me of something that happened to me when writing extensively. So I felt more like a child who spends a lot of time on the bed because when I write, I feel like I'm fixed on somewhere. I feel like I'm not going out. And the scene sort of kept converging to a scene of being on the bed as a child. And that also made me feel very weak, strangely enough. I felt like uh, when I'm writing, I don't understand Wow, how on earth other people in the world get on with so many complicated energetic work while writing is very um, light. And I also felt that the, my interiority uh, constantly got impeded. Like for example, at night, when I would look out through my window, um, I often felt like the night like void is going to come and simply re my consciousness into pieces. So to me, writing seemed like an invasion into the integrity of consciousness. But I returned to writing because I felt like it was the only way to restore it. Very interesting. So you return to writing is the only way to restore the sense of being invaded, this idea of, of weakness, of being on a bed, which is you know, the idea of sleeping or passivity, of looking out to the, to the night through the window, as you say, um, the idea of, of, a, of an invasion of interiority. So you're welcoming something in, your position with respect to it is receptive. This is one of the characteristics which has marked um, inspiration, the notion of inspiration we've seen in the West, no doubt in the East in general, um, for thousands of years. Inspiration includes the idea of receptivity, you're being receptive to something, you're open to something, you're weak with respect to it. And inspiration also includes the idea of, of activity. You respond to that weakness, you act, you get on with things. And Abir, what you're saying here is, um, as when, you, when you think about this experience of writing, it puzzles you how anyone can be energetic, how anyone can do anything at all. Because one part of inspiration is so much about passivity that it seems cut off from from that part of inspiration that would lead to activity in some way. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else at all? Any, any other respondents? Anyone care to, re to, to reflect on their writing process when it came to responding to Blanchot's um, primal scene question mark in parentheses. As what we're leading up to here is, is what I'd really like someone to do is actually read out the text they've written. But let's take one more general reflection before we move on to uh, before we move on to that. Anyone else care to volunteer at all? What I'll ask in then instead is Christopher Zimmerman, if you'd, if you'd open up this idea of inner, inner necessity that you mentioned in the, um, in the chat box, what were you thinking of when you linked location to the idea of inner necessity? Well, I mean, the sense that there is this something that's propelling the writer in the face of frustration, failure, all of these, you know, solipsism, solitude, all of these things, there is sort of an inner pulsion, something that is, it's not quite clear what, but there is this inner necessity. Uh, the writer, um, 
writes irrespective of the, the pain <laughs> of writing. There, 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 there's an urge, there's an inner urge, there's a necessity you have to write because you don't have a choice in some ways. And that goes into your idea of the call or vocation. Um, yeah. There, okay, there, yeah. There's, there's something, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's something that is propelling the writer. So this idea, a beer talking about a beer talking about something a passive sort of experience. But here, Christopher, you're talking about something which which propels us, something which moves us, a pulsion, um, irrespective of pain. So the feeling that one must do something, that one has to do something, has to be done. And this is something as I commented in the chat box just now that um, is often unanalyzed in in literary writers' texts. Someone like Beckett, Samuel Beckett where everything is analyzed and thought about. One of the things that, I'm saying this off the top of my head, so I might be wrong about this, but I think I'm right in saying this. One of the things that, that Beckett doesn't discuss is the urge to, to write itself, the urge to communicate, the urge to make a text. That is the great unquestioned thing in all of Beckett. Think of the, the play, Waiting for Godot, if you've seen this play, it's two characters for the most part, mostly two characters on stage. They're talking about the futility of doing anything. Beckett's character on stage, talking about the futility of performing any particular action. Nothing really changes. They fool about, they lark about. But what's never in question in Waiting for Godot is the need to communicate. There are two characters talking to one another. There's always this desire to communicate. So the inner necessity is something which is unanalyzed. It's, it's something which seems almost unanalyzable. Um, where do we locate it? Where do we understand it? Why do authors feel this? In Jos Pavici's work as well, it's not really analysed. The writer is someone who wants to say something that won't be satisfied by saying this in conversation. It has to be in the form of something written, something composed, which is kind of mysterious. Anyone else have any, any thoughts about the primal scene in your writing in response to the primal scene? Anyone else care to volunteer their ideas? Can I say something? Hello? Please. Yes. I hear you? Yes, uh, I think uh, life is a journey. It's a bad part, known to know, enjoy, happiness, sorrow, all are part of I think you're journey. breaking up a little bit for us. I'm not sure the signal's very strong here. If you can alter something about the way you're speaking into your microphone. Am I able now? Hello? Yes, yeah, a bit clearer. Carry on. Um, I mean, I'm sharing this life is a journey. It's the path of unknown to known joy, happiness, sorrow, all are part of our, this journey. I mean, there is no certainty of our life. This uncertain beauty, this unknown, always tells us about hope. It says there is something beyond this cloud here. The specter went to sorrow. He had the same ordinary sky with clouds, gray light, belly, daylight without death. But suddenly, the same sky again. He finds the new light of hope. He's writing, which opens the door for him. Okay, so I couldn't pick up well, that much he, of what you were saying, but um, I, I picked up some things. There's a mixture of joy and happiness. Um, in the face of that which is unknown and uncertain. And this generates a kind of hope. Now, um, that's what I've taken from what you've said. I, might, I, hope, I hope I've grasped what you said there. But this idea of hope is a very interesting one. Um, hope in what? Hope in the act of communication. And you know, the idea that you can communicate, that you open yourself to somebody else. This opening can be something which occurs intrapersonally, but for the writer, it's not enough that it occurs interpersonally. It has to occur from this inner, inner necessity towards an unknown audience. I mentioned in the first part of um, today's session, Georges Bataille addressing his, his writing to unknown friends. You find this in the work of, of Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche as well. The idea you're addressing an audience. Um, those audience, this audience is not something, is not an audience composed of your peers. In fact, you know, for, for Nietzsche, it's, a, it's an audience that he himself has to, has to compose, has to constitute has to bring about. 
There's, it's not an audience that exists presently, something which, you, which, which lies in the future. And that's what I hear when you refer to this idea of hope. And also to return to the theme of Beckett, we've discussed Beckett before. Um, again, you know, people will often say Beckett's work is very gloomy, it's very pessimistic. Um, but for me, it's, it, there's, there's, there's indistinguishable hope in Beckett's work. And that's the hope of communication. The communication itself is some desire yes. for hope. That you reach yes, out the shore the through what you say. Yes, so communicating yeah. with yourself communicating with yourself when you are in pain or you are just not have I hope in life so you have to communicate with yourself I, I, I feel the same way actually so even if you, so even if you're in pain there's still the hope of communication so an author like yes, Franz with Kafka, yourself. an author yes. like Kafka is writing mm -hmm. and he's writing for an audience and you, you put yes. this very interestingly the idea of writing for yourself or with yourself in some way but you also break out of yourself, even if you're writing to a future self, you're writing to a future. Your writing is legible, it's there on the page. It's, it's opening out some kind of audience, it's, it's reaching somebody. So for me, there's a hope implicit to the act of writing. And it's the hope that the writer will find some kind of community that will welcome her work, that will understand her work, that will be able to receive her work as what it is. Any other thoughts about the, the primal scene and your writing of it? Now, what I'd really like it now is would someone like to read their text? I, mean, I know this is very improvisational, open ended, but would anyone like to read the text they've written? They've just written in response to the Blanche show. Lars, could I read mine? Please. Yes, please do. All right. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, this sort of came about in relation to reflecting also from before on uh, the writer's biography. Um, and I was thinking about it as is this problem between biography and thanatography um, and the relation of death. And um, as I mentioned to you, uh, this, this text is very important for me, this Blanche show, uh, Racy. So I'll just read what I said and then mm. have done. Uh, reams of pages, years and days, yet never the light of day, never to see the light of day. To suggest abortion would imply it ever really lived. Nocturnal writing, waiting to unwrite itself, making no avowal. Never since, ever since I died, the birth of the writer has hung in suspension, hanging fire. Not quite a ceasefire, but the proximity bears its mark. Writing for no one, explicitly. Writing to forget, to forgetting. Thank you. That's very interesting, the idea of writing to forget. And what is it that, what is it that you'd be forgetting? What is it that you would write to forget? Any, any, these are abstract questions, but what is it they're trying to forget by writing? Hmm, I, I don't know. I suppose that there's a sense of, Forgetting the way that I think about writing is this moving away from oneself or this distancing, uh, distancing oneself within oneself or a sense of subjectivity. Mm. Um, obviously, I think of Blanchot's idea of uh, le neutre and um, how language sort of opens us up to this, this neutrality or this, um, this sense of something which underwrites all of us but belongs to no one of us. Um, and, and so it's less uh, to forget something as much as to open oneself to forgetting, or in the case in relation to the primal scene, to open up to that sort of void of the anterior, the impossible necessary death that Blanchot speaks of, this death mm -hmm. which precedes birth and is never experienceable in itself. Yes, fascinating, isn't it? Um, this phrase that Blanchot uses in, in writing the disaster, um, in some of the fragments that seem to concern the primal scene, impossible necessary death. And let me just uh, frame some of your remarks there, Alex, very interesting remarks that you made. But in Blanchot's work, writing is not just about expressing yourself, expressing yourself in the first person, expressing yourself as an I. One of the things that came up earlier was the idea of modern subjectivity. The idea that uh, of Cartesian subjectivity, or the subjectivity we find in Descartes. And in Blanchot's work, 
when you express yourself as a literary writer, when, when you write, you pass away from the first person altogether. You move into some form of expression that is no longer linked to you as a particular individual. It's quite hard to grasp exactly what Blanchot is writing about. It's, it's, it's something which we can sense or feel sometimes. Let me go back to this idea of inspiration. Often when writers are spoken about inspiration, not just writers, musicians or artists, right, um, inspiration is presented as something depersonalizing. We use that word possession, to be possessed by something. We can also use this word dispossessed in the same way, actually, oddly enough. We're, we're, we're possessed, we're dispossessed. The word flow has come up earlier today, the idea of being in some sort of flow, an, an impersonal flow. You're given over to something, some kind of movement, something which streams through you. Well, this something for Blanchot is, we shouldn't think of it as being in the first person. Something else is happening. And when Blanchot comments on um, the primal scene in writing The Disaster, he does so in the form of various dialogues. There's various dialogues in the, in, in the writing of Disaster. But Blanchot has his conversationalists in these dialogues discuss what's happening in, in this in this strange text, primal scene. And he wonders what's going on. You know, these, 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 these um, conversationalists are not exactly sure what's going on. But one of the things they suggest is that we understand it in terms of a relationship to, to some kind of dying, to a fissure in the self, something which the self always and already lacked from the very beginning. And I talked about Blanchot and Freud, Blanchot, in, in the writing of Disaster, engages with other psychoanalysts as well. Notably, he engages with um, a British psychoanalyst called um, D.G. Winnicott. And let me just call up my, my own notes here. So bear with me for one moment. Um, just to remind myself of Winnicott's dates and this sort of thing. Uh, D.G. Winnicott, he's a psychoanalyst, was a psychoanalyst, lived from 1896 to 1971. And Blanchot responds in the writing of the Disaster to a posthumous essay written by Winnicott called Fear of Breakdown. It's a very interesting text. It wasn't published until after Winnicott died. And what Winnicott argues in this text is that many mental illnesses later in life have their origin in helplessness that we felt as infants, as very young people who had not really yet entered language. So mental illness later in life comes from a helplessness that we felt when we were very, very young, before we could speak. And indeed, what Winnicott argues is that if you are afraid of a breakdown, of nervous breakdown, of depressive breakdown, one of the things that might help you is to show you as a patient that already, right away, as soon as you were, as soon as you were able to speak, there was something left behind. As soon as you're able to integrate yourself psych psychologically, there was a prior dissolution, a prior breakdown. So in the beginning, it's not a unitary Cartesian self, not a subject in the, in the, in the modern way, you know, a subject of like, like the, a Cartesian subject. There's something, something else, something fissured, something lacking. The idea for, for Winnicott is that we can even help patients who are very afraid of death. We can say to these patients, look, you died before you were born. And what he means by this is, before you were born, you weren't integrated as a self. There was no coherent self there before language. What was there instead? Well, Christopher Vinsk, of the European Graduate School, who writes about this in his book, Infant Figures, is an experience that we can call dying. It's very mysterious. Let me try and open up another dimension of this by talking about another psychoanalyst that Blanchet refers to. And this psychoanalyst is called Sage Leclerc. He wrote a book called A Child is Being Killed. Very important to Blanchot in this, um, in this text, and also important to Christopher Finsk as well. Leclerc is a psychoanalyst, and he borrows some of his ideas from Freud. As Leclerc argues with Freud, when you're very young, as a baby, your parents think you're just great. Your parents think you're just wonderful. You know, 
they, they, your, your parents see in, in you as a baby what they would have wanted to be when they were young, as a narcissistic object of some kind. Now, Leclerc argues that parents lavish attention on their child. But if the child can enter language, the child can step into language and to individuality and to be able to say I, the child has to leave this, this narcissistic self-enclosure behind. The child has to, has to leave behind this, this self-obsession. Leclerc makes this programmatic claim that in order to step into language, in order to become someone who can say I and assume their existence, each of us has to kill this wonderful child, this wonderful child who our parents adore and think is fantastic. We have to leave that child behind. There's an impossible but necessary murder a murder of this wonderful child who is a projection of our parents that we have to undertake if we are to step into language. The full language is simply this narcissistic representation. As we step into language, we've left it behind. We've left behind the infant. Infant, etymologically, this word suggests someone who can't speak. So in order to be able to speak, we have to leave behind this infant child has to be killed and not only that but this child is someone we have to kill every time we speak every time we use the first person there's an act of primal negation that happens over and over again from this perspective we can understand Lancho's primal scene in the writing of the disaster as a staging of the experience that we have when we step into language that something has to be killed. And what that child sees, the child who is seven or eight years old, what that child sees is something on the other side of this step into language. That which is always lost, that which we cannot access in and of itself, that with respect to us, we, must, we might have to consider as a kind of dying, as a kind of prior death, as a trauma that we can never negotiate. And this is what Blanchot is thinking about when he writes the primal scene. This is that which lies before language that nevertheless returns over and over again every time we speak. And here's what I want to say about Leclerc and psychoanalysis and Blanchot. Every time we speak in ordinary language, as I'm speaking to you today, speaking to you right now, we have to somehow murder this child. We have to somehow overcome this primordial whatever. We have to kill it, have to negate it. But what's interesting about literature for Blanchot is literature is a way of attesting to it, of letting this thing murmur through the literary writer's work. It's so wonderful that Blanchot uses that word interminable. We also hear in the translation of Lespector's work too. Something interminable happens. Something reverberates through the writing. Something resonates through that writing, which reaches us as readers. And that for Blanchot is what defined the literary writer. So returning to your comments there, Alex, um, this is a very long detour, but I'd want to understand what Blanchot is doing as a staging of what it means to write. But at every stage, we, when we use language as a writer, we're concerned to try and open up our relationship to this interminability, this void of interiority, as you call it in your, in your piece, this moving away from oneself, this distancing of oneself within oneself. I'm using your formulations. This is what language, language use, literary writing opens us um, onto. So thanks very much for those for those comments. Any other responses to a primal scene? Anything else? I can Anything? share some. Please do. Um, this conversation just made me think of two really amazing um, episodes of a pop psychology podcast called Radio Lab, um, but I come from like a psychology background more about research than 
psychoanalysis. Um, but in one of them, it's kind of two case studies. One of them is about a woman who has a stroke and loses her access to language. Um, and it's really interesting because she enters this realm of experience that has no language. And what she describes is that it's incredibly joyous, um, which really fascinates me. And then the other is about uh, a deaf man who, I don't quite understand how this happened to him, but he was never really exposed to deaf culture, never really understood that he was deaf and um, never learned how to speak or how to use sign language. And um, this woman wrote a book about essentially trying to teach this person sign language. And she describes this long process of trying to mind things to him and he's just not getting it. Um, and she describes the moment when he finally realizes that things have names which is not something that had ever occurred to him before. And that that also is just a moment of like immense joy. Um, they're sitting at a table together and he slaps the table and begins to cry and starts pointing at things in the room. Like, oh, that's a door, that thing that's there. There's like a word that refers to that. Um, so I think those are both really interesting it's, to think it's about. It's fascinating, light yeah. of because on the one hand, you're talking about this woman who's lost language and she finds a lack of language joyful. It's really interesting, isn't it? The idea of being emerged in a, in a world without language. And what language allows us to do is to group and organize our experience to sort what's happening to us. Once we can name things, we, have a, we, we can grasp what's happening to us. We can grasp what's, what's going on around us. We can name what we're feeling. We can name objects. So language is something which gives us a mastery over our experience. We can sort and categorize what happens to us. We can build up a general sense of, of what's occurring. And this is something which, which your, your, your deaf man, who's learning that things have a name, also finds joyful. So in both, in both, uh, both times, there's a, there's a kind of joy, both in a lack of language and a joy in, in gaining language, which is, which is extremely interesting. A joy in this pre-linguistic Eden where things no longer have words, where everything is singular, where everything is different, and also a joy to being able to name for the first time, being able to use words to manipulate language, to say things. So there's a very interesting, very interesting contrast. How did you find your, your writing in response to Blanchot? How did you approach your writing? Me? Yes, Annalise, yeah. Oh, um, I just tried to write uh I wrote a poem or something I can read it I was worried that I'm talking too much so I not at all please carry on um, so you so you so you wrote a poem in response and how do you find yourself responding did you find it a text that um invited um, a rich response did, did, did it open you up in, in an interesting way as a writer oh um yeah I think so I mean I don't know that I would have written this if you hadn't prompted me to, but I think once I started, I ended up going somewhere that excited me. Good, okay, excellent. So these idea of prompts, creative writing is all about prompts of various kinds, uh, ways in which we can be opened up to, to writing something. Typically in creative writing, the prompts take, take quite ordinary forms. You know, it could be what you saw on the way to the creative writing workshop, um, the letters of your name, I've always been interested in the idea of, of working with theoretical texts and philosophical texts to try and open up a more complex kind of prompt, you know, a more a, a deeper kind of prompt in, 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 or a richer kind of prompt in some way. Anyone else res, um, care to respond to the primal, um, care to um, read out what they, what they wrote in response to the primal scene? Anyone else at all? Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Andrea, yeah. Uh, uh, this oh, is Alan. On, Alan. Alan, sorry, Alan. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I I wrote something kind of insane. It's a it's a it's a sort of a, a film scene. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, and oh, sometimes God, I write uh, texts that go over films and film essays and stuff. Mm. 
Uh, so so I'll, I'll read you my, my crazy little text here. Hopefully it's not too long. A woman meets a woman wearing a corset at a Buto strip club in New York City. They begin a kind of ritualistic dance. The woman in the corset pulls up the other woman's shirt. Guggenheim is written in Old English font. At an angle from her hip towards her center, she has to peel back the pants a bit to read it clearly. Voice over. I could go up two tax brackets. They are interrupted by smoke filling the room. The walls imploding, distant fires burning, strange crushing noises of twisted metal, oceanic geophones and hydrophones picking up sub bass sounds as they get on all fours and crawl through the burned out ruin of civilization. You can hear helicopters and planes flying overhead, anti-terrorism messages playing staring at sterile warnings and difficult to decipher CIA jargon, which is reductive and restricting. We're abducting it, disappearing them, target with covert countermeasures, disarming the guerrilla force and then modernizing their tactics and weapons and rearming them. A representative sample of the new caliphate, which will rule for 200 hours, insurging the insurgency, extracting the uncooperative militants to the black site, resurfacing the mujahideen in our own image. This announcement is being juxtaposed with art world language that is additive and exaggerated sterile, stern but sterile. And then there's a bunch of text which is blacked out like a sort of redaction. Unnerving and intense sounds of doom descending and ascending. Plain shadows begin to subsume their figures briefly as they fly over. The two are crawling and some of them are churning. It slowly morphs into a distorted nightmarish opera track, a chorus of voices, the distinct perfect falsetto voice of the NPR friendly folk singer Adam Torres and a melismatic Middle Eastern woman singing in an Arabic style over walls of heavily distorted, delayed and affected guitars, electric violins, mellotrons, chaotic but rhythmic orchestral percussion. They are still crawling through the wreckage of humanity. They come to some people seated in a U-shape in a desert field. The smoke apparently is coming from an academic presentation by the filmmaking visionary, composer on natural and PhD candidate in literary, musical and visual thought, at the European Graduate School, Alejandro Michelangelo Fargasonini. There in the desert is giving an academic presentation of his work, which resembles a Jean-Michael Jarre concert from Houston, Texas in 1986, famous for the largest crowd of all time at a concert, but with much more contemporary music and performers who are stricken in cod pieces, capes, strange makeup, lit like some sort of Buto strip club. Nuclear style fireworks are going off. There are more smoke machines than people in the room and he's talking about 2020 as the year zero of cinema and his self as some sort of anti-profit. He's playing a souped up cheap violin and a guitar and a table with some sample pads going on about how the year zero will reset everything when his feature film comes out. And the line between television, social media and cinema will blend into a year zero of cinema. The beat is contagious. The singers are in a trance like state harmonizing through strange television, social media Ascending and descending scales of seemingly unrelated passages with bits of harmonizing in his Western and her Eastern style that freeze. And then it turns out that the apex of the frenetic doomed concert is a SpaceX or NASA style rocket launch at a sort of safe distance, which totally dwarfs the large scale nuclear singing fireworks, the terrorists and the singers, et cetera. The students and fellows in the presentation grab their helmets and flip under their desks. Planes, shadows and helicopters pass over once more towards the rocket launch but it escapes the Earth's gravity in an utterly depraved inferno of rocket fuel. Heat and light faded to black while the two singers slowly come down and the noise and music fade. Okay, wow. <laughs> that was some journey you took us on there. That was great. So what interests me here then is you're thinking, um, as a filmmaker, I was keen to hear from filmmakers today. I, you know, I'm really glad that you, you spoke up. Um, as a filmmaker, you're working, am I right to think this, on the image and the word at the same time. So you're visualizing what you can show on film and the accompanying words. Is that, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And I also wanted to comment, I write in this crazy style, I think as a kind of uh, a way around, if I write something very clearly, I, I'm a filmmaker who writes and I direct my own work on mm. tiny budgets, right? So often I can't get the hardest thing for me is to get the actor to say something in the way that I want when maybe I'm not always working with a professional actor or whatever, a high end actor, you know? So, um, I have this crazy maximalist style, I think in part 
to where if I can't get something that I find precious to be put into the film perfectly, it doesn't matter because I'm coming with 10,000 pounds of stuff. You're, you're going to become less pressure. So you, you bombard the um, the person experiencing your films. You've got you've got so much material, and the stuff you're reading to us is that is that stuff you read over um, images, or does that include uh, what, what, you know, how, how would that work with respect to the images you're using? So most of this is meant to be what the camera is seeing. But there was some in the middle there that was a sort of announcement as well. So um, I don't know what I'll do with this piece if I'll ever be able to actually make it into some kind of film. But mm. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely has some major themes that I've done before, you know. So there's a lot of specific language there. I made a film once that was about the juxtaposition of anti-terrorism terrorism language that's been invented basically by intelligence agencies and um international art language uh and the anti-terrorism language is all about hiding everything and redacting and disappearing people and destroying things and the international art language is all about exaggerating and trying to put like you know uh stealing some philosophy words from Deleuze to talk about like some crappy paintings or or something that's amazing you know mm. So it, it's a much more uh, added and subtractive for the anti-terror language. So I've, I've kind of just blurted this out uh, here in your workshop, but I, a lot of these things are things that I'm coming back to. Okay, so what interests me here then is this idea that you're combining language. Um, you've got a language of, of redaction um, for, for terrorism, a language of exaggeration and drawing on, on theory um in, in in the art world i was interested to see this idea of, of this year zero this these years of zero of cinema this reset towards which everything you're you're talking about seems to be heading and exactly you know how does that operate in your work what, what sort of thing are you thinking about here so this is basically the 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 uh main push of my dissertation i'm a phd candidate here and um and my alter ego is the is the PhD candidate giving and getting a presentation in this thing, and so um, yeah, it's a it's a theory that I that I have about where cinema is restarting in this century, mm. and um, very strangely, uh, the COVID epidemic has sped up all of the things that I was speaking about to actually just collapse. So. For instance, there's no more films in theaters or, and they'll probably never recover. I don't know, maybe they will, but mm. it will always be a, a, a sort of special, it, it, it's not the way that people see things anymore at all. It's not even 1% of how things are viewed anymore. So mm. that, that's one aspect of it, but yeah, there's a lot of others. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's uh, there's a lot there. There's a there's a lot to unpack. But um, but thank you. I've been I've been enjoying your course greatly, and I've just been sitting here um, drinking coffee and 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 manically writing this stuff. So I thought Great. I would try to share it. Great. Well, thanks very much. I mean, I, I really wanted to hear a filmmaker's perspective on this. It's very interesting to see what what how how this has translates into in something visual. So I was very interested to hear that. Anyone else care to read out what they've been writing? Um, in response to Blanchet. Go ahead, please. Um, I was not here for the first half, um, but I am coming from writing um, as, a, as an artist. I was trained in visual arts mm. in undergrad, and, um, actually with photo and video and digital media. Mm. Um, and now I write code poems as an artist, uh, and I took mm. a surrealist automatic approach, so I only wrote for about five minutes. Um, so it's kind of literal. It was the night before Christmas, and the boy who cried wolf, eyes wet, bed wet, cannot utter a single sound, for he is just mortified. Aghast, his mortal soul protests his wide open eyes. Wet, sitting in his pee in his bed, the boy who cried wolf feels himself become weightless as the window panes of his bedroom expand to take over the entirety of its bedroom wall 
and suddenly out and in, here and there, collide. How many there or here? A sole soul or an array? Array of diffracted particularizations of life-giving sunbeams that no longer pass through window panes from there to here, but are near, so near, as near as far, and one, perhaps, emanating, dividing, and all the same. Il y a plus d'un, c'est possible qu'on vrai dire, il y a toujours plus d'un. One sheep, three, seven, or again, one. But the boy who cried wolf is not able to do math, nor construct narrative, nor law, so he, infantilized, literally, does not, will not, cannot, respond. The animals, was it a sheep or a wolf? They morph into one another, multiply, then condense back to one in undulating rhythms of breath. His breath is slow. He goes back to sleep, false alarm. Thank you very much. That's extremely interesting. So the, the, you call it a code poem, is that right? Not this one, but I, I, uh, I have a practice of writing um, poems in like okay. a Java, a Java code format. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this, this, this poem is it, it, it's surrealist in that sense. It's you're accessing automatic writing here. This is something written automatically, yeah. without forethought, without planning. And what you're doing, you're taking up some of these ideas, some of these images of a wolf, of a boy who cries wolf, of, of a multiplicity of animals, of a knight, of a child who's who's in bed. Um, you're taking these ideas and just letting them flow. You're letting these things flow. I think what it always interests me about um, automatic writing is the kind of discipline it needs. You need discipline to try and stop your stop your thought branching, stop ideas um, uh, becoming too monological. How um, is this a technique you work with often? Um, <clears throat> I would say only in. Um... In my notebooks, when I'm like thinking of an idea for a poem, but eventually it will turn into the code form at the end. And tell us how this code form, how do you translate this into a code form? How, how does that actually operate? Well, um, so like functions um, are like mini programs within programs. So when you call a function, or it's called a subroutine or a method, a function, it's like a verb and you name them. So you get to name them like a verb and then you have objects that are manipulated and they're named as substantive. So it's really easy to like. And then there's reserved words that belong only to Java that you cannot use for anything else. Like if, while, uh, do, break, um, there's many words and you can play with those as well. Um, yes. And do you, see, do you see yourself as somebody who's primarily a writer? Is that how you, is that how you understand your own activity? I think I've, I, no, not really. I think I've taken up um, as a minor study like poetry that relates strictly to my own work so like concrete poetry which like began mm. in south america which is interesting and also south america um and so but no i would say that it's very visual for me and like i'm just trying i don't really have a background in, in literary studies or yes it's, it's visual again I, i'm really keen to talk to people who who work here work visually rather than linguistically it's very interesting to hear you say that okay any other responses any, anyone else there's a fantastic diversity of responses here Anyone else want to read out what they what they wrote in response to the Blanchet Primal scene? I'm willing to read mine. Great. Um, this is Kirsten, is it? Kirsten, yes. Kirsten, yeah, fantastic. Please do. Um, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, um, mm -hmm. so writing is a part of my work, but privately. Um, I write. I need to write to work, and I need to work to write. Um, but I'm not a writer. I don't consider myself a writer at all. Um, so, okay. A ritualistic burning. I knew it was coming. That's why I brought the box of books. It was, for a moment, the edge of a coin because there were witnesses. I could have shared them a page or two. They asked me, are you sure? Don't you think you should save something a page or two? But no, I was resolute, they had to be buried. It was too dangerous to let all of that year exist, to be used against me, surely. They thought I was angry, that it was a passionate, impulsive act. That fire kept us warm. Hmm. That's extremely interesting, wow. 
yes, yeah, so you, you're, you're saying you're not a writer, you're someone who is primarily a visual, a visual artist. Yeah. So writing is, is not something which, I mean, you don't feel that vocation to write, but you feel a vocation to, to work with visual materials. Is, is that right? Yes, yes. I, um, but I've always, I've always written. Um, mm. And I need, I need to write to figure out uh, what I'm making, what I'm painting. Um, and I need to paint to figure out <laughs> the things that I'm reading. Um, you know, they, they, they have to go together. That's very interesting. So the writing and the painting, the writing helps you figure out the painting, the painting helps you figure out the writing. And in this scene you, 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 were, you were reading out, is this interesting idea of, of sharing, giving, giving a page or two away. Um, but the, the, the pages are too dangerous in some way that need to be buried in some sense. I'm just interested, does that resonate with other things you write? Does that, does that something, is that something you, you, you talk about in other areas of your, of your artistic practice? Um, yes, I mean, it actually, this is based on a, a true story. Um, which is what that was my response. This this reminded me of um, the reading reminded me of this moment. Um, there was a year uh, when I was mainly writing, and I filled up. Uh, I think it was seven notebooks full of thoughts, poems, um, observations, some drawings, mm -hmm. songs. Um, and uh, at the end of the seven years, I mean, the seven years, it felt like seven years. At the end of the seven notebooks, at the end of the year, um, I just stopped. And then I didn't write for a very long time. Um, and then one day I decided to burn them all. So I threw oh. them in a the fire. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy... Wow. Yeah, <laughs> and, I don't know about uh, you, but writers. I think someone who's uh, felt that sense of vocation as a writer might that find might find that quite hard to do. The idea of of, um, of burning that's extremely interesting. You know, and it took me a long time after that to write again. Um, mm. But I've I've just started, probably within the last six months, really writing uh, more consistently with an urgency instead of. Um, as a practice, I guess. Mm. So with a sense of urgency. So an urgency of, is this idea of trying to understand something by means of writing? Yeah, it's, it's like a necessity. It's, it's sort of, um, it's sort of uh, how, I, how I work in my studio. You know, I, mm. I, I work because I have to. Um, mm. Nobody could ever see my work and I would still be making work. Mm. Uh, and I, I guess writing, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's COVID. I don't know. These are, these are all the things that I'm figuring out, you know, why mm. I'm still do why am I doing this? Why do I need to do this? Why do I never share it? Why do I not feel the need to share it? Um, so this was hard for me. My heart was pounding right now because <laughs> mm. I've never shared really anything that I've written um, with, you know, 66 strangers. So. Sure. Yeah. It's very interesting. I'm very glad you did it. It's uh the coming from a visual angle is, is so intriguing to me. I'm so I'm so non-visual, basically. <laughs> um, you know, so much draw, so always drawn to writing, but yeah. I always sense that the, 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 there's the other, which is the, the, the visual person, the person who um, who might feel a sort of sense of visual vocation. And I, I always find it quite unfathomable as to, as to what that might mean. So yeah, so what you're dealing with here in the text just seems seems to be important. Seems seem to be something in there. Kind of not something which um, it seems, it seems to have a structure, something like a primal scene. Now we can abandon this sense of primal scene in, in a strict Freudian sense, or even in the psychoanalytic sense, um, as being to do with some sexual thing from from when you when you were a child. But how about this idea that a primal scene is something which you don't quite grasp, you don't quite understand, you're not exactly sure what it is you're doing, but you feel compelled to do it. That seems to be animating your relationship with writing, Kirsten. Is, is that is that right? Uh, absolutely. I I can definitely relate to that. Yes. Um, it's it's sort it's how I work too. Um, I in my studio. When I say work, that's what I mean. Um, I I don't work in a structured way. I don't 
do uh, paintings based on sketches. Um, it's very much, you know, it starts as automatic drawing um, and then the structure shows itself. Um, it does seem to, to point to this idea of a primal scene as being fundamental to artistic practice across the arts in some way. Mm. Um, and, you know, this is, I'm not sure whether this, is, whether this might be is the case or not. But something, you know, there's this idea of being drawn to the unknown, of writing as a practice of open-ended improvisation as responding to some kind of lack or fissure um, seem to be drawn to some some idea of dying, perhaps, or, or leaving behind this Cartesian self. Something of that sort. Something, something's being, you know, I think, who, else, who spoke about that earlier on? I, I forget now, but all the names written down here. Um, but this idea of, of, of a lack of something missing, something that we're looking for. And it seems tied up to this primal scene that we hover around, uh, those of us who, are, who feel this sense of vocation, the vocation seems to pertain to this, um, this experience which, which returns. Now, the final thing I want to draw out of the primal scene is a um, sense of temporality. So let me just return to my, some of my notes here. Um, I wanted to, to round up some of the things we've been talking about, I think. I think we've been talking about these things. And this is the idea of, of, of what you do when you do creative work. Hopefully, you know, this is my this is my hunch as I, as, as I was writing these these notes. Hopefully, this will illuminate what some of us are up to. You know, in Freud's work, he talked about Nachtraglichkeit, this idea of deferred action, this idea of afterwardsness, where what happens is something we're not really aware of, um, we're not really able to grasp, we're not able to experience it, and that what we might do in our, our artistic practice, our practice of various kinds, is to try and make sense of it to try and write this out, to try and discover what lies at the heart of this, of, of these scenes, um, is an attempt to, to recapture this, to restage it. And this is, is what Freud talks about. Um, there are experiences which reveal themselves only, and this is a term, Alex, you've been using in some of the comments, through some kind of translation. You know, the, the, these terms uh, that somehow our unconscious works with respect to this primal scene through a kind of translation. We try and translate this fascinating scene that occurred before we entered language. We try and translate this into, into experiences we can then make into an artwork, you know, that we can we can put into something, that we can we can construct something from. Now, so this this temporality then um, is the idea is that before we enter language, there's a, there's a, this moment which uh, Blanchot calls the um, the pre reci the pre-narrative, that which doesn't enter narrative, but nevertheless is, is the condition of any possible like, um, narrative, the, the possibility of using language of telling stories. There is an event that, you know, which, which is obliterated as soon as we enter the possibility of telling stories, of speaking, of using our own name. This event disappears, but it fascinates us. We want to return to it. We sense its approach, its recurrence. We sense it's coming back as a, and through a kind of repetition. It has a rhythm that, that belongs to it. But we can never quite seize upon it as such. And it's something as a, as a temporality, as a notion, as a theory of time, which is fascinated um, writers who, who came after Freud in, in the psychoanalytic tradition. And which also, I think, Blanchot recasts in his work um, that what the primal scene as a a fragment is all about this text which Blanchot writes so late in his career, which comes about, you know, as, when he's very ill, he's living in isolation, um, he has a feeling of something which has never been, he's never really written before, although it does recall a sentence or two in, the, in his previous book, it does recall a letter that he was supposed to have written to Roger Laporte in, in 1966. Uh, but it seems a sort of a testimony um, that he's writing here something which at last he's able to, to talk about. Um, this, this, this whole process of Natrogishkeit, of deferred action, now finally, towards the end of his writing career, this is what he's going to stage. And it seems to be, be about his relationship to, to language, to entering language as such. 
and it records other moments of ecstasy in thinkers like Nietzsche. Remember Nietzsche on the on the shores of uh, of Lake Silver Silverlana in 1881, and Nietzsche talks about the thought of the eternal return when the fundamental ideas of his later philosophy coming to him in a kind of ecstasy. And he writes, I had cried too much. These were not tears of tenderness, but tears of jubilation. And he recalls Pascal, the great mathematician, the great um, religious thinker, the great philosopher. Pascal's tears of joy on the 23rd of November, 1654. He had this experience which overwhelmed him. He felt, as he said, I'm, you know, I'm, this is a loose quotation, he felt the presence of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, not the God of the philosophers and scholars. Certainty, certainty, heartfelt, joy, peace, the world forgotten, everything but God. Joy, joy, tears of joy. He wrote this down and he, I think he put it into some kind of locket and he wrote this, this text he kept close to his skin for the rest of his life. And I think we see something of that in the Spectre as well. The Spectre's work, which is often so intense, so full of these extraordinary experiences. That text that she wrote on the 2nd of May, 1970, this text that she wrote about emerging from the void, trying to understand herself, the beginning of writing, seems to capture, seems to point towards something quite similar to that. And again, it's this idea of a trauma that only reveals itself subsequently, and only reveals itself later. Here I am talking away, I hope I haven't been talking too vaguely, are there any, any comments anyone would like to make? We've got a few minutes left. Anything any, anyone would like to say? Anything anyone would like to ask? Go ahead. Could I ask a question? Please. Um, first, just thank you so much for um, hosting this workshop. Really appreciate the time to, um, to do the writing and to, to think along with everyone here. Um, so my question, I guess, is specifically for you, but maybe for all of us in general as well. Um, so you, you, I guess it's, it, and it concerns the, I mean, as you introduce the workshop as a creative writing workshop, I guess my, my question is, um, how do you as a writer and as a thinker and as a scholar um, distinguish when you're writing creatively and when you're writing critically? Um, and is there, when you sit down to write, is there, <clears throat> I, I, and is there even a distinction, I guess, uh, for you? Um, how, how do you regard that distinction? Do you appreciate having a distinction and to say, no, this is my critical writing, this is my creative writing? Um, you know, you have the, the, the two books from Paul Grave and quite a few from Melville House, and um, they're, you know, they're differently marketed, et, et cetera, um, in different genre. But I, I wonder for yourself as a writer and as a thinker, um, and you talked about this a little bit at the beginning, um, sort of talking about how uh, how you've sort of decided at a certain point that um, the type of thinking that you wanted to be doing might be better suited to a, a, a field which allowed you to to explore in the ways that you wanted to. Whereas in in the discipline of philosophy, you felt um, matching yourself up against the sort of as you were, I think, speaking of sort of the giants of philosophy, the these um, particular minds that you you felt since I will never I will not be one of them I will engage in this other um, in this other way and I'm sorry if that summary is is leaving out all the most important bits um, but I was just wondering it, it, as you as you see the work that you're doing um, you know some of us are in, uh, attempting to sort of engage multidisciplinarily. Um, in writing and in thinking and, and everyone we've been talking about or bringing up today to some extent um, carries over or is, is hybridized in some way. I was just wondering for yourself, as you work, how do you, how do you engage with you know, these, these distinctions, these maybe institutional or academic distinctions between creative and critical or um, creative writing and critical um, writing? Um, and then also in your writing practice um, and in, in the work that you're doing, how do you, um, how do you, it, 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 I, I guess I, I, I feel like you haven't really uh, left philosophy, right? You're still doing that. You're just doing it in a different, um, in a different way. Um, that's, that's, that's part of my, I guess that's my thought or my question. Perhaps that's, I'm, I'm off, but 
Well, thanks very much for this, the, the, these reflections. Now, that, that's extremely interesting. Um, yeah, the, the related to critical and creative is something which you know would be a wonderful workshop to do in the future and, and think about this in, in some detail. And I think that the people I, I would want to think with would be Ellen Sixu. Ellen Sixu, I think, is particularly interesting on the relationships between the creative and the critical. So that's something I would love to think about um, looking through her texts. Answering on the spot, um, and, and, you know, just, just, uh, I would say that you know, my primal scene would be someone who, who's failed as a thinker. You know, this is, this is it, this is the great failure, was being able to, un unable to measure up, unable to do it, unable to carry it through. I had all the opportunities in the end, a full-time academic job, and not able to, to make my mark on the subject. And this is, this is, this is, the, this is my old biographical moment. Uh, but what was really exciting about creative writing is that it opened to me exactly that point. I always say, I, I always think to myself that I write from a British distance. And some of you are based in, 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 in Europe, some of you are based in all over the world, you know, India, all over the place. You know, I'm a very provincial person. I, I barely traveled. I, I live in the UK. I live in a very provincial part of the UK. Um, I don't have a you know, rich international culture. And my feeling has always been very, very much on the periphery, you know, very much in, in, in the mar marginal places. I write from a British distance, which means, and some of you here might be from the UK, I'm, I'm, some of you might have the same sort of attitudes as I have innately, which is I can't quite take myself seriously as someone who thinks, as someone who theorizes, as someone who quotes literary texts. I can't, I can't take myself seriously. I find it humorous. I'm always divided in the way I speak. I, I find it... Um, entertaining. I find myself, it's like a kind of buffoonery um, in, 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 in my relationship to talking about serious philosophical or theoretical matters. And that's what fuels the writing, which I do, the creative writing. Critical writing I don't really do anymore. Um, it, it's, it, I find it painful. I find it very difficult, very hard to do, to write normal sentences. Um, I like to throw myself into a text and try and f um, find a flow, like Cool Keith, you know? It's a, and, and find a flow which is depersonalizing, which um, in which I can I can lose myself. It's a joyful self loss. Um, and these are things which are it's a primal scene. So in the sense I, I don't really understand it. I can't really work it out. I'm always reenacting it every time I, I, I begin to write. I don't really comprehend it. And that it's the engine. It's a driver of, of what it is I do. Continual feeling of, of, of failure and buffoonery. But, you know, it's something I'd like to think about formally on another occasion. And I think Ellen Sixu is someone I've always found very, very important as a, as a thinker, as a practitioner, in the way that she's both and does both and, and thinks in her literary work. So but thank you for your, thank you very much for your question. Thank you so much, appreciate it. I guess we're, it's nine o'clock here in the UK. It's different times for you all over the world. I want to thank you very much for this. I'm looking forward to reading the chat. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of messages there for me to read. I'm greatly looking forward to it. And thanks for, to the EGS for, for hosting this event today. It's been really, really, very, really, very, very exciting. Great to hear from visual artists, people from different backgrounds. It's wonderful to hear this multidisciplinary community at the EGS. We don't quite have that multi, multidisciplinarity at uh, Newcastle University where, where I work. I think it's, it is just fantastic to hear about the kind of work that's being done. It's, it's really inspiring. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye.